Welcome to the June 8th, 2023 In-Depth City Council meeting. Crystal, will you please do the roll call? Council Member Freilich? Present. Council Member Osborne? Present. Council Member Gordon? Present. Council Member Brockert? Present. Council Member Gindrich? Present. Council Member Lewis? She's waving, she's present, yep. Council Member Hopkins? Present. Seven present, zero absent, Your Honor. Thank you, will you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and we have several items to discuss tonight. The first item is 4A is a discussion and possible direction to staff regarding the possible disposal of city-owned property on 8th Street. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Good evening. So we're going to talk about the disposal of the property we acquired on 8th Street as part of the um, West Hills sewer separation project. So tonight's agenda, we'll talk about why we own this project, um, review any considerations for the possible disposal of the property, and then we'll just have some discussion and wait for you to give me some direction. And so we're looking for direction on should the property just be sold to the highest bidder or should we take into consideration any possible priorities or preferences that might further other goals that the city has. So for background, um, this is the property that was purchased in um, January of 2021 with the goal to facilitate um, the West Hill sewer separation project by, and this particular property was purchased because it was determined to be the safest um, route to, to conduct that sewer separation project. And um, just for reference, if you're not quite familiar with where it is, so obviously it's on 8th Street at the bottom of the hill. This alley is the alley just behind I can't find my arrow, but um, just behind Climber, so it's a block, a half block south of Climber, and then, so this is the house as it set at that time, and this is the house as it sits now. Um, in May of 2022, there was a change order that um, included moving the building, building the foundation, and um, some code upgrades that will, are required when you do such work. And during that time, we opt, um, the city council and the county adopted Ignite Vitality through Workforce Housing, the local housing plan that established these priorities that we talked about at the last in-depth meeting. And we um, also adopted strategies a little bit later that supported both in um, supporting home ownership and the rehabilitation of housing in the community. And then most recently, we adopted, or you all adopted, um, a property disposal policy at the direction of the of legal counsel that requires us to go through a, a public bidding process and to market at fair market unless it furthers a different goal, at which time you have to outline that in the request for proposals. And so this is where we are today. Um, the property was actually almost three quarters of an acre. So um, once the house was moved to the back of the property, it was determined that there was actually enough property to um, subdivide it for a second lot housing lot. And that's this picture up on the top shows what that lot is, is generally gonna look like. Not necessarily where the house would be at this time. There was actually a proposal to, if we had to move another house, to potentially moving a house to that lot we already owned and then um, this is just a picture of how the house sits on the lot now as you can oops sorry <clears throat> as you can see the the house sits back quite a ways on the lot and providing enough space for a second home um, and then this is how the house is oriented as well and this is what it looks like inside. So in the middle of the picture is the basement that was constructed with the foundation and is very nice. Um, then this is, the other two pictures are pictures of the upstairs of the property. The home was actually built in 1955. So it, um, 
has some modernization-ish kind of to it, but largely it sits in its 1955 condition. And so the estimated value of the home when I talked to um, a couple realtors was about 140. That's what they feel like we could sell it for. The other lot is somewhere between 20 and $30,000 probably, or maybe. Um, so that's kind of where we're at today. And so this is a lot of typing, I'm sorry. So there are just, and it was just meant to be kind of, if, if anybody wants to entertain some, some discussion on should we provide preferences, should we target any particular population. We're having a lot of conversations right now about workforce housing and um, do we wanna do anything to kind of further that on our own or just like I said, sell it to <coughs> highest bidder. So should there be a preference for first time home buyers or owner occupants? Should there be income targeting 80%, um, 120% um, as the maximum income? When you talk about workforce housing, a lot of times the, the, the de facto common denominator is 60 to 120 percent of AMI um, in that in that workforce housing need and then um, should there be preference for respondents to, that are going to make commit to making further improvements to the home beyond that 140 then should there be preferences do we want to work with a nonprofit to make those improvements if we want to support that effort um, if we worked with a nonprofit would there be an interest in equity sharing so like um, rebuilding our habitat, took it and invested some money to improve it, would there be any interest in kind of splitting the profits off of that with them? And then would council like to apply the same or different criteria for the vacant lot? Um, at, you probably can't read it on my paper either. Sorry, I should have brought you a copy of it. Um, and I can go back to it, John. And then, so those are the simple questions and we'll go back to those. Um, the next steps for us would be to develop an RFP in accordance with council's direction tonight. Um, then we would receive the bids and then we would come back and present that the most appropriate bid that meets the council's goals. Um, and then with the award of that bid and the documents to transfer the property from the city's <coughs> ownership at that time. And then we're back to the direction shot, sought. So. so if we, what you mentioned about working with a nonprofit, like we're building together um, or Habitat for Humanity. If uh, they were to work on it, they could sell it and it'd get back on the tax books mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Yes, so once it goes back into home ownership, it will be back on the tax rolls. It um, would remove the property from our, from our ownership and then they would do the work. They would invest that money. I'm not proposing to put any additional funds into it, just that we would then it would be there, there's still some desire, obviously, like Habitat, they're looking at a way to both further the goal, but also to do their next project. So they're, they look at, you know, how do they make a little bit of money off of it as well, um, to just to reinvest, that kind of thing. Council Member Osborne. Um, you know, we did have Hab <coughs> Habitat in here last week asking for, you know, us to identify a property similar to this. I think this would be a good fit for that, but assuming we move forward would we divide the property ahead of that or would we you know turn it over to in any event over to somebody and then you know expect them to come back to the city with a request to divide the property or no we're actually in the process now Doing brian's now. team actually has a is working with the engineers to do the subdivision and so then we'll actually process the plat um we're hoping in july to have that that separate that new plat adopted and so then it would go and we wouldn't actually go out to bid we wouldn't release the rfp until we actually have the legal description of both parcels okay well i'm you know normally i would want to see the you know the market go um however in this case you know we have had this request we have a history with the organization of being successful and very quick about turning mm. properties over and getting them back on the tax rolls very quickly which is the ultimate goal. Council Member Gordon. Okay, I mean, we might have to have a plan A and B because they may not be interested because they traditionally build yep. from stick. And this home needs more work than what we're seeing uh, because the move was the foundation. As I was told a couple weeks ago, the inside is not completed. It looked like we saw an appliance in that picture. Is that a still refrigerator? There? <laughs> yeah, lone refrigerator. Um, so it's foundationally set, but the, the interior is going to need work. So 
talking what forty to seventy thousand dollars probably in finishing on the inside uh, and we haven't seen what the bathrooms look like and the utilities and the kitchen and just the basic uh, things so if we sell it at 140 I mean no matter what it's gonna get back on the tax rolls that's our goal um, and if we sell it at 140 as is somebody's gonna have to finish it whether it's them or habitat mm -hmm. um, I'm I just I'd rather just get it on the market so in the interest of full disclosure, and I'll watch my boss and see if she starts shaking her head at me, uh, was that we actually, before we had had the discussion about the new policy for the disposal of property, we actually had, I had a conversation with Habitat, and they are interested in cha in expanding their model. And um, <coughs> we talked about it at that point, and if, if it's fixed, it'll sell for probably about 170 just due to the neighborhood constraints, right? But um, I actually don't think there would, I, at 140, the, the feeling with the people I've talked to is that there won't be a lot of actual direct reinvestment to improve the value of the property by the home buyer if it's an owner occupant. That was my thing. I think for anyone to buy it for 140 ish and put the right amount of effort into it, it's probably going to price itself out of the available market in that mm -hmm. area. I mean, you have to consider there's no driveway yet. I mean, there's some things outside that you'd have to do, so. Yeah. Uh, there, there is a lot of um, landscaping work that would have to yeah. be done to, mm -hmm. to, to make it a livable space. Councilmember Brockert? I guess what concerns me in all of this, Jody, is um, <coughs> granted there's the big vacant lot out front of this house now. Um, does that not make, if someone builds on that lot, doesn't that make the house that already exists less desirable? If it blocked access, I would say potentially, but it actually, the access is pretty good because that alley is a pretty decent alley. Mm -hmm. So I right, don't think right. it, I don't, I don't think there's a, gonna be a significant change in the value by building in on the okay. front of the lot. Yeah, personal preference, so I wouldn't want my house to be behind somebody else's like that. Well, it's just oriented different. And it is not oriented, I mean, to be honest, it's not oriented on 8th Street. So mm -hmm. the, the front of the house will not look at the neighbor's house. It'll still be like a side house. So, so it would look at the alley instead and in the back the of the houses yes. on Climber. Yes. Yuck. So oh. Sorry. <laughs> Councilmember Gindrich. Uh, no, it's not that significant, but it's a three quarter acre lot. And then uh, subtract the uh, new lot that's being platted. Is that correct? So you'd have two lots about equal size of. Yeah, yes, about a third of an acre. Yeah, each. okay. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm with Peggy. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think we ought to try to get rid of the properties as quickly, expeditiously as we can. If the uh, community organizations that have shown interest can uh, 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 work with us on that and, and make that uh, a quick process, I think that would be great to work with those organizations too. But uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think everything associated with this situation has been more than what we thought. And. Uh, I think we ought to cut our losses and uh, get out of get out of that situation as quickly as we can. Now, the new lot that is uh, proposed or has already been uh, platted for, uh, will that lot be able to have access to Eighth Street, cut in the curb, and have a driveway? Will Will there be be able to cut a driveway in there so <laughs> access there? And will the house be able to run north and south on a front door? Yes, Fa it, like facing 8th Street. Yes. So a new property, a new home could be built, mm -hmm. cut into 8th Street curb, and uh, pull right up into there. One or two. St there's uh, enough width there in that new uh, platted lot to build a two-stall garage and a two-bedroom finish. Is is it? Is and is that ground able to have a basement dug in it? Yes. Okay. Okay. Because, you know, in, in looking at that uh, new lot, if, uh, if that house had to be situated uh, on that new lot to where it, it, it faced that alley, 
to get in and out of there and pull down that alley, which is opposite of the house that already exists because the house that already exists has a nice flat driveway, two stall garage, fix it up, pretty nice house, you know. But unless everything's been taken care of to make sure that that new house on that extra lot is taken care of, which to me, the only thing to be able to do is be like I say, face it to 8th Street and uh, pull in off 8th Street, cut in the curb and that kind of thing, that's not too bad either. either. And if you can build a basement, is good. So in a nutshell, uh, you know, I think we ought to work with uh, uh, the agencies that have shown interest to you guys. Uh, get this thing underway, get it sold, and, uh, and you know, if we can get, be interesting what we sell that lot for, but uh, uh, twenty or thirty thousand dollars, thirty thousand dollars, you know, I hate to be a glass I'm with you. half, <laughs> uh, a glass half full type person, although at times I have been, uh, but uh, if somebody would offer, I've said enough, <laughs> okay? Any questions, Mayor, on what my direction is, I guess? I think I know your direction. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank uh, you. And, and Peggy, I hope I, I oh, brought you into this conversation appropriately. I love it when you do, John. I think we ought to get it going and get out of it. I, I think we need, again, it's an A and B. So A would be we have a conversation with the agencies to see if they're interested and give them a short time frame. We're not going to sit on it another six months, so whatever that short time frame is. If they choose not to, which is possible, we get it on the market and we sell it. Do you know about how long it would take for them, if they are interested, to actually start and like a time frame? They, so from our early in the year conversations, there was a discussion about if they were to get it, the goal would be to have it occupied by a partner family by late this year. Okay. Is that what you were gonna ask? Nope, I'm good. All right, so is council okay with uh, <laughs> them seeking basically, uh, what, was the, what was the terminology you mentioned? An agency. An agency, is council amenable to that? That's fine. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let's start going up path. Yeah. Angie. Oh. Angie. Angie, uh, we need to unhide her. Angie, if you are okay with that, wave your hand, please. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And next, we will review review a feedback from contractors meeting on the proposed building code update. And next steps. <coughs> Welcome, team. <laughs> Council, Mayor. Oh. Council, Mayor. Carol, I'm sure you guys remember us. Uh, my name's Nick. I'm one of the building inspectors here for the city. Uh, I'll start us off and then hand it off to one of the other guys here. Uh, our agenda is we're just going to give a quick overview of the process. Uh, we're going to go over what the, uh, what the responses were and what our proposals are for those responses from that contractor meeting we had here a month or two ago. Uh, and then we'll have an overview of the next steps after that uh, outside of it kind of in tandem with those responses and then uh, we would of course like council feedback we would like council feedback <coughs> our direction sought would be uh, does council concur with our responses and then is there any additional feedback that council would have? Uh, for the background, the goals of the community development department has been a safe and long-term building environment. Uh, we, the fiscal year 23 department 
uh, work plan includes the adoption of the 21 versions of the International Code Council Family of Codes. Uh, February 9th was that presentation to the council and then April 5th was the community meeting where we discussed some of those code items. At that meeting, the attendees were asked three questions. What is currently working well? What, op what opportunities exist in using the new 21 codes? And then what other thoughts or questions should, should be considered? That meeting was open to contractors and the general public and then council as well. Hi, I'm Seth Gillette, also a building inspector with the building department. Um, so at the meeting, we received a lot of feedback that uh, kind of we filtered into various categories. Uh, several were suggested for amendment. There were approximately, there were about six of them. Uh, we had to kind of condense a couple of them. Um, they are as follows. So we have the... Uh, People wanted to know about requirements for engineering. Um, they wanted to know about uh, residential sprinklers. There was a lot of talk about residential sprinklers. Um, when they are applicable uh, and potentially what the exemptions were and whether or not we would be willing to make other exemptions. Um, there were some concerns by uh, some landlords and electricians about removing some laundry room GFCI requirements. Uh, there was talk also by electricians about whether or not we could um, remove the 200 amp electrical service requirement and they talked about establishing an appeals board and incorporating existing building uh, considerations into our processes moving forward. Ooh, I got the wrong one. There we go. So regarding the engineering requirements, uh, there was a lot of talk about post-frame buildings. Uh, currently, our post-frame building, uh, currently, uh, build post-frame buildings that are over a thousand square feet, or uh, the post spacing or the sidewall height uh, greater than thirteen feet, or a post spacing of eight foot on center. Uh, that's our current requirement for when we require engineering for post frame buildings. Uh, we have discussed proposing an amendment to exempt post frame buildings up to uh, 1,440 square feet instead. Uh, we found that this may align more with the size of buildings that contractors typically uh, seek to install, um, and we don't believe that there's an increase in the risk. Uh, regarding other buildings and their engineering requirements, we are still deferring to the state's engineering and architect requirement matrix. Uh, for the residential sprink sprinklers, um, primarily the talks were about a, uh, a assisted care facility or residential care facility here in town. Um, since then, on May 2nd, uh, state law has enacted a new exemption that removes the issue entirely. Um, those types of buildings are now solely handled out, out of the residential code, no longer out of the uh, building code. The laundry room GFCI requirements, um, so this is specifically related to our rental facility maintenance code. Um, it will be considered late, later, later when uh, we are planning revisions to that section. Um, the electrical service requirements. Uh, so currently, Muscatine Power and Water uh, has a standard of 200 amp electrical service for residential uh, dwellings. Um, it is technically their requirement, but we have it adopted in our code uh, to provide clarity. We recommend keeping it in our code uh, for the clarity. Um, otherwise, people, they could get approved by us for a different service 
and then be unable to hook up their utility uh, because MPW will refuse. Um, did I miss one? Yeah. Okay. And then as far as an appeals board go, goes, uh, some contractors had, have requested this um, specifically for construction and building code compliance. Our department is in support of it, and we would like to propose uh, language to uh, revive a previously existing appeals board. And lastly, our existing building considerations. Um, so there are certain challenging challenges in renovating older buildings to comply with our current codes, um, specifically re, uh, having to do with fire assemblies and separating different occupancies um, and potentially adding sprinklers. Uh, currently, we use the existing, the international existing building code uh, for such projects. Um, and we use those because they, they guide us based on the the amount of work that is planned for the project and the changes in the occupancy, as well as potentially any changes in um, accessibility or egress pathways. Um, the, we would recommend using, uh, sticking with the international existing building code, um, primarily because it already takes into consideration the uh, changes in the time, the building, the building methods and the furnishings are a lot more uh, flammable these days and the, the smoke is a lot more toxic. Um, so there's a lot of considerations that are already available to us when we review such buildings. And then we also received a lot of other questions and feedback regarding internal policies um, the permitting uh, and application process. Uh, there were a lot of questions regarding um, licensing of contractors in town, uh, how we're handling unlicensed or, um, for lack of a better term, uh, bad contractors, uh, contractors who are doing uh, poor work. Um, and there was also a lot of talk about understanding when permits are required. Uh, generally, just a lot of interdepartmental policies that we can enact in addition to a lot of uh, better community education. Um, so we are going to be discussing, discussing those as well uh, later, uh, potentially, um, as a part of our community uh, outreach. And then I will turn the ending here over to Andy, unless someone has any questions. I have a question. So yeah. the appeals board, um, yeah. what, what, was, what was that makeup last time? You said that there was an appeals board previously. Yeah. What was that makeup? Um, well, I don't recall the specific details for it. Um, I do know after speaking with Andrew Fangman, he said that it died out because they're, they weren't able to find people who are interested in uh, taking the positions. Um, we were potentially looking at having uh, uh, tradesmen, uh, so like an, elect an electrician, a plumber, uh, mechanical expert, uh, various contractors. Um, we haven't hammered out the specific details, um, and we do intend on digging a little deeper into what we previously had and uh, potentially um, making it a more appealing station to take I was I was able to do uh, some research and I, and I know this is just looking at like Ames Dubuque and some of the other cities yeah. in Iowa so um, there's seven which I think seven might be too much but there's one licensed architect one professional engineer general contractor home builder master electrician or it could just be an electrician mm -hmm. contractor plumber and then HVAC uh, technician so it yeah. just hit like the full spectrum yeah, that would that okay. would probably cover just any project really. Gotcha. So okay, great. Thanks, Seth. Yeah, no problem. Could, oh, sorry. I'm going to have John first. Council member, you sure? Peggy, go ahead. Okay, so the appeals board uh, previously were those people still in the workforce doing work 
Are they retired and out of the business completely? Are there any conflict of interest with an appeals board, electrician? Uh, I, you know, how are we going to handle that? Uh, as far as that goes, I would, I would imagine that if they did have a uh, vested interest in a project, that they would have to recuse themselves. Um, then why have it? Then why have it? Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm not big on appeals boards. No, I, I understand. I think, uh, 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 we've got uh, building inspectors and that kind of thing, and I think you ought to do the right job. Yeah. You know, so um, not, no offense. You know. Yeah, no, I understand. Uh, I believe that um, we often we often have contractors or people who disagree with uh, with our interpretation of code. Um, we can feed them the the code, you know, all day. But if they disagree with it, I think it would be nice for them to have a third party that they can voice their concerns to. Um, uh, ideally, a uh, with an appeals board, you have a lot of different opinions that go into the mix. So it might. Uh, help prevent one person being responsible for making those decisions. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Council Member Gordon? Um, we already have one appeals board, uh, the mm -hmm. planning and zoning. So not that you should mirror it 100%, but we've already got a foundation set that we already yeah. have that. And they have like five members, volunteer based. So using part of that as your foundation to build up your code, yours is gonna be different because they need to be trades necessarily yep. but there's still a volunteer base of residents so i encourage it especially since we heard from them this test it for a couple of years and see how it goes okay uh, but i would look at how that one is developed and see if we can mirror some of the basic foundations yeah instead of starting from new yeah there's there's certainly a lot that we can learn from the existing uh from the existing appeals board the zba but the uh um, I imagine that the older one that we used to have probably isn't usable in its current state mm -hmm. or as it was originally written. So, After attending the one last night, or Tuesday night, it was really interesting to see and they engaged. Uh, one was very quick, one was very uh, a little more lengthy, but the board engaged uh, the resident and came up with a really good solution. So it was nice to see. Um, but I would use that as a sort of a foundation and then build on that. And even if you have to put in there and say, we're gonna try it for two years, uh, if it fades out, then it wasn't as big a request as what we thought. Yeah. And then I do have a couple other questions, but I don't know if we're ready for those. Any other okay. questions for Seth? Well, uh, I believe the, the prior screen, uh, Seth. Yeah. Uh, this one here? Yeah, that's not in our attachment. Is it, Council, um, am I missing something or? Uh, are you uh, an attachment for the the slides specifically or no. oh it isn't okay well, we can forward it to council we can forward the slide I uh, yeah. do plan on making a uh, separate sheet for organizing these into uh, um, further categories we can supply that as well if you'd like to talk more about it well, yeah, well, I, you, and I just question you, not yeah. to try to put you on the spot or anything, but I, those are interesting uh, criteria that, uh, you know, really all of those uh, thing, uh, items mentioned there are extremely important, and I don't have them in my, so I'd like to. We'll get you a copy. Yep. Sorry, John, I just wanted to clarify. So these items were not included in your staff report because they're not related to code changes. They're related to customer service and processes internally. So they'll be, um, and Andy will talk about that in a minute about those are included in the next steps as well. Thank you. Council Member Osborne. What, what is driving this to be on this year's uh, goals for the department? Why, why the, um, why do it now? Uh, well, in large part, we've we've already kind of dragged our heels on on getting updating the codes. Um, we would like to stay current with uh, the International Code Council uh, family of codes. Uh, right now, or pretty soon, they'll be they'll be um, going into the printing. Or uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Andy, but they'll be working on the 2024 codes pretty soon and uh, start taking in requests for the 2027. Yeah, uh, pretty this, shortly. Has the state of Iowa um, or any city around us adopted the 21 code yet? Uh, yeah, so there, hang on, I actually might have 
Uh, currently, the 2021 codes are adopted by Marion, Johnson County, and Lynn County. Um, Davenport and Bettendorf have adopted the codes uh, per the state, strictly per the state. Um, and there's been a couple of other uh, municipalities around us that have kind of adopted their uh, still using much older codes. Um, there's a few that have upgraded to the 2018. That is certainly an option. Uh, the 2021 code simply provides us a lot more options without being a lot more strict. Uh, there's a lot more that we can we can do with it. Okay, and what's um, and the state of Iowa is currently on 20, 2015, correct? For the IBC and the IRC, um, I might have that written down too. Yeah, 2015 uh, International Building Code and International Residential Code, 2020 NEC, which I believe we've already formally adopted. I could be wrong on that. Do we have okay. So, um, and then they've adopted the 2021. Uh, uniform plumbing code and the international mechanical code so that's currently uh, and like I said Davenport and Bettendorf have adopted those exactly okay and last question we've we've struggled quite a bit with uh, historic buildings here in town mm -hmm. Muscatine's fairly unique in in that it's one of the third oldest you know very close to Iowa you know within a Six months or so, you got five cities in Iowa that could complain, can, can claim to be the oldest, and mm -hmm. Muscatine's within that five. Um, you know, we've got some of the oldest. You know, Iowa City, for example, would be one of those, but they've demolished a lot of theirs and moved on. And um, I'd really say that Davin, uh, yeah, Davin, not Davin, uh, Dubuque, and Muscatine really are, you know, the ones with a lot of older stock. What is your, you know, you offer no solution in this revision for 2021. And as these revisions keep getting more and more of what they are, mm -hmm. they strip farther away from what we can do with this old housing stock. So what is the answer there? I mean, right now I feel like we're, you know, this proposal kicks that down the can even further. I mean, mm -hmm. 2015, the state of Iowa actually revised, you know, added a, a chapter for historic buildings. We, for whatever reason, Muscatine did not adopt that part. And Well, um, and I will kick this over to, to Andy. Uh, he's done a little bit more research on that. Okay. As far as the historic buildings go, uh, I don't know that it's a fair assessment to say that we haven't done anything with them. Uh, I've studied the state historical code at, at length. Uh, first at the suggestion of, of uh, Councilperson Osborne. And largely what it does is it takes any semblance of local control from our community. This is written to be a state standard. All of the, there are several deletions that take out the administrative portion of the IEBC, that's the existing building code Seth was speaking about, it takes out the administration, takes out our, our rules for issuing permits, for inspecting the work, for making sure it gets done properly, and it assigns that all to the state. And that's primarily done for jurisdictions that don't have any sort of building codes. A lot of cities don't. Uh, at last count, I knew of uh, 11 out of 99 counties that do have building code enforcement. So this is primarily written for all those areas. What this does adopt is the 2015 International Existing Building Code that we do with, with one basic exception is that it deletes most of the accessibility that's in the IEBC and it converts that to a state standard. Uh, from what I read, I didn't get a chance to study that state standard at length uh, as much as I would like to, but it truthfully doesn't change much. It just changes the places we look for those answers. And that's, that's the best assessment of that that I can give. Uh, I've got, I did print off a copy for myself because I was studying, studying these this afternoon. Chapter 301 uh, of the State Building Code that's the administration that we would have to follow under this, but we don't really have any authority to because it's all state of Iowa. It's not city of Muscatine. 
and then uh, the accessibility standards. And these are just the directions to use when you get to the state code to try to look those up. Council member Osborne had a quick question. Sure. I just want to make sure you're you're complete first though. Yeah. Is yeah, I think okay. I think so. Go ahead. So I'd like to say that the characterization that it takes control away from Muscatine is is also not accurate in my opinion. Uh, for example, the the state of Iowa adopted the twenty fifteen international code and so did Muscatine. But that doesn't say that Muscatine is now following the state code. It is our code. We're follow, we're we're administrating it, we're doing it. Um, I, don't, I don't understand the argument that if we were to adopt another piece of Iowa code and make it our own, that it's not our own code. Well, I'm, I'm, with all due respect, I'm not trying to make an argument. Uh, what I'm saying is it simply doesn't change what the stipulations would be. We're still going to have fire separations in buildings. We're still going to have sprinklers. The, the things that have been sticking points in the community, this state code does not alleviate it just doesn't there there's not the language to do it and and even if it did i personally wouldn't be comfortable recommending it yeah i think that whether it does or not is a matter of interpretation um the 2021 code for example brings in things like if we've got if we're replacing one window in a building now you have to have a certain r value you have to you're basically boxed into buying a, a modern window. Um, if you're in a historic building where, you know, the national expectation is you're gonna keep the single pane glazed squared windows, you're gonna have one window that doesn't look like all the rest of the windows just, be, just because you need to meet the 21 code. And those, it's just one example. I don't wanna really talk that, go down the rat hole of that one example, <clears throat> but it's one example of where, again, this, this bar keeps getting raised and we obsolete these old buildings that way. On the surface, it, it certainly does look like that. If you, if you call me to try to pull a permit to replace one window, that's a repair. We don't, we'll tell you you don't need a permit and to, to buy the window you would like to and make your repairs. So the... Well, I think the... You know, we, we try to put... Call, calls a repair that it's got to be like, for like materials, right? Uh, okay, so a, a 40 yeah, by 48 right. window is a 40 by 48 window. As, as far as we're concerned, as far as the code is concerned, that's a repair. Uh, but that's you not know, like, with, like if we got into all of the fine details of every decision that we make on a daily basis and tried to put it in ordinance form, our ordinance would fill this room with paper. We cannot simply put a box around everything. There's got to be some discretion, and that's where that's where the building division, our staff, need that little bit of leeway. Those codes are written gray intentionally because you're never gonna you're never gonna be able to make everything fit inside that box. You know the the state code as far as historic buildings still comes back to you know if the building def official determines it's unsafe, then it's unsafe. If the building official approves something, then it's approved. You know, we, we can't write down every scenario in which we could approve something. It, it truly is a case by case basis. Council Member Gordon has a question. And I'm sorry, this is off topic of what you're talking about right now. Um, I had a resident that had a question that sent to me, if that's all right, as a breaking point right now. Okay, cool. Um, and she had two questions. One was about solar installation, and I know we're going to be talking about SolSmart coming up in the next few months. So I think she'll see some positive things there. But one of the questions from the resident was, are there any, anything in the code about energy efficiency requirements when you're making new construction or... Uh, yes, there are. Uh, in, in the IBC, there's a chapter dedicated to commercial energy efficiency. And uh, I believe chapter 11 in the IRC also is, uh, is energy conservation code. And we, we have a separate, a separate code book. It's a 2021 international energy code 
Energy Conservation Code, I'm sorry, the state has adopted a 20, the 2012 version of that as the minimum. And that's the bar that we use currently. Nine years old, so. Um, and do we sort of administer to that the 2012 or the 2021 code? Uh, f for that particular code, it's, it's the 2012. That's a state minimum. I don't believe we have it adopted officially. Okay. That's what the state tells us we have to enforce. There, uh, she was just concerned that we're, you know, we're moving towards improved energy efficiency and everything like that and making that that voice is heard. So, and then her other topic was solar, but I think we're bringing forward that topic pretty soon, so. Yes. Just wanna make sure that that was heard, so thank you. And I do wanna say one other thing on your categories here on your parking lot, a lot of lean opportunities there and categorization and grouping. You're not gonna do them all at one time. Pick one or two and work on them and start getting them done. That's a great start. Yeah, I'm getting them down you know, on paper, on a list, I think is a big step. Uh, we heard a lot of things that I don't, I'm not sure we were prepared for, but we also heard a lot of things that we didn't necessarily, uh, didn't get a surprise from. Go after your low hanging fruit and book a success and then yeah. go after the tougher one. Yeah, we've, we've talked about that a bit. We like quick wins when we can get them. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, uh, thank Council you. Member Gordon, may I just, just for the public point out that um, solar, you can already do solar panels, the MPW does have a program for that and they do support um, homeowners who wish to have um, rooftop solar. So that is available. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me, city administrator. I guess uh, at this point as good as any to ask if, uh, if we could get a concurrence or some feedback about what you'd like to see if you'd want us to come back or if we're or if we're on track to come back with ordinance language. Councilmember Osborne. I'd like to seek council support for a couple of items. Um, the state of Iowa has not yet adopted 2021 International Code. The state is currently using 2015 International Code with state specific chapter for historic buildings. I'm asking the council support to begin the process to adopt the state of Iowa's Historic Building Code chapter 350-661, it is a ready-made chapter and verse to be adopted immediately in Muscatine's current code with title and no, with little modifications. If desired, it can be adjusted to 2021 code at some later date. In a separate request, I also seek the council support to postpone further discussion on adopting the 2021 international code until after Iowa has adopted it. The advantage of this being the state may again adjust the state's historic building code and Muscatine <clears throat> Council can consider adopting those changes as well. So two things. Okay. Can you restate your uh, first one? The first guess, one is just sum it up. The first one is to immediately um, adopt the the current chapter. Um, 350-661-350 to our 20 for our, to our current 2015 international code. And we're not making any votes. This is just uh, consensus. consensus and yep. direction. And consensus I consensus on direction. Yeah. And I'm. Does everyone agree? If no. No. And, and not that it's not a great idea, but I think the percentage of permitting or the requirements is a small percent of historical versus a larger percent, I'd like to see us move forward and not wait on till Iowa does something. But well, that'd I'm be not, the, that'd what does be other council sec, think? That'd be the second request, well, but. Councilman Fraley. But the immediacy, I, we need to read it first, so. What's, what he's suggesting is just the historical code, and I agree with what Jeff was saying on the historical code. Now, the 2021 is a different, whole different subject if we're adopting a whole code for 2021. And I think we need to discuss that further before we adopt it. Yeah. I, don't, I don't see enough reason to adopt it yet. Um, before you get too far down the track, I just want to make sure council understands the implications of, of what um, council member Osborne is suggesting because how I understand the code and Jody may need to 
step up, but the that state historic code, the first bar is that the building meets the definition of a historic structure. And that um, I it copied all of you on an email. So there's a there is a hurdle there that has to be met. Fall mm -hmm. I have uh, I have a comment on that as well. Okay. Um, in addition of accepting one or both of these requests, I, we have the freedom to adopt Iowa Code as it is written, or in whole or in part. And I'd like to st staff to engage Muscatine's Historic Commission to specifically review the state of Iowa's definition of historic for possible consideration of what defines historic in Muscatine. I would not like to constrain this conversation to it must be this or that, the outcome can range from completely adopting it as you have said, or um, some other definition that suits our needs. So there are, there, are, there are steps there that we would have to vet and understand. I don't know if that's possible. If it is, we can explore that. I just, what I understand is that you have to have a qualified third party De, uh, d um, determine whether or not a structure meets the definitions as outlined in the code. I want to just, I, I'm just telling council we would need to and would recommend that we vet that before we would take an action. The, the code reads that it, of opinion, it doesn't specify whose opinion, or certified, but it's not just certified. That's not the only path. I understand um, that's that why it's I'm not. Saying, that's why I'm saying that, you know, maybe the Muscatine's Historic Commission might be involved in helping us craft that opinion or certification and what, whatever that means. I'm not dis disagreeing with that. I'm just saying there's a step there that needs to be taken to understand. I, I do know it can't be our opinion. It can't yeah. be an inspector's opinion. It needs to be someone who's qualified to make that judgment. Right. And, and this is just a request to go do work, right? That's what you're saying is we know go do so more work. If I, if I may just finish my thought here. So the first step is what, what, what are the implications of that? So if we, if one is who would identify or, or meet, ensure that a building that would follow this code um, meet the criteria of a historic building, there may be a variety of ways to do that. The second one is once that is determined and the state code is adopted, then who is responsible for the inspection and um, and uh, verification of conformance to the code because the the as I understand it the resident in the residential code still applies that's still under this code section so it doesn't alleviate a person who has this historic building from following those requirements I believe and I will need to verify this that then that would put that in the state's hands to inspect. I want to make sure that we know what we're doing <laughs> before. And it may be that council wants that, and that is absolutely fine if that's what you choose to do. But I want to make sure you have an understanding of what you're approving. Yes. Andrew, I have a quick question. You, there's a meeting coming up with the contractors. Is that correct? At the end of June? That, uh, and the purpose of that meeting, again, is just to update them on the, the 2021 building code on what it, what it means, how it could affect them and basically is that accurate uh, yes we have that meeting scheduled for june 28th uh, i believe we're going to try and use a conference room at the library again uh, if we could make the schedules line up and and that's exactly what it was for it's to it's to discuss what the proposed amendments might mean what changes it would make for them how they might need to do things differently uh, but overall for for the kind of business that we do in muscatine and that kind of construction work we have the 2021 is not going to make a major difference as far as code provisions it does relax a lot of things uh to jeff's point about waiting for the state to adopt the 2021 uh the state doesn't usually make major changes for for the 2015 code they have the 2015 existing building code with amendments that put it in state jurisdiction. When they adopt the 2021, I would bet dollars to donuts they do the same thing. It'll be the 2021 and it'll be very, very similar, if not straight up identical. So if, uh, so Seth, Nick and Andrew, would you, in your professional opinion, with this meeting coming up with the contractors, your recommendation, I'm just curious, but do you recommend we wait until you get some feedback on what their thoughts are on the 21 code? Or 
just well, I just your your opinion. That's what I'm curious. You know, about. I don't I don't know that we're really asking for feedback. That's more of an education and outreach opportunity. Uh, we have found from from past instances that it's it's much better to to talk about that before they come in with their design and their permit application. So I think that's primarily what our goal is for that meeting. Okay. Any questions, Councilman? Yeah, oh. Real, real, real quick, um, we would like also like to take the opportunity to find out specifically what contractors are interested in, um, in terms of the changes. Uh, we have kind of put together a small list that was it was put together by the ICC. And we've removed some of the the seismic details. Um, I would like to bring the uh, significant changes books and go over, uh, allow them to read the index of that book and find out if there are any specific concerns that they may have um, that could potentially lead to us uh, creating new policies or discussing how we're going to handle uh, certain inspection tasks in, in making certain determinations. So I just want to let um, everybody know, so Council Member uh, Lewis asked if we could just have more discussion on the topic. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Council Member mm -hmm. I would I would like to wait until after that last mm -hmm. meeting to continue mm -hmm. this yeah. on and see what comes out of that meeting I, and then make a better <coughs> judgment at that time. I think I think that was a part of our plan that we did want to have that meeting before we considered doing a reading of any pro per proposals that we would make. That's that's what I agree with. Mm -hmm. Council Member Osborne. I don't think we've closed the loop on my first request. Um, I, I would like to make it more clear. <coughs> it's two separate requests. We could adopt the 2015 historic Iowa code and it would not affect any of this discussion at all. It would not, sh it would not stop us from going ahead and adopting the 2021 code this fall or on whatever timing. Having the 28th meeting it wouldn't stop any of that. Now the second request would, but the first request, I, I see them as very independent. They're not linked together. They don't make one more urgent than the other. But I do think we need to move forward on some kind of historic code while we spend time hashing all this out. What does council think about that request? Uh, and, and we're not voting today and nothing's just like we're consensus. Just a consensus. What does everyone think about that? Okay, yeah, question for Jeff. If we, if we adopt tw this tw 2015 code, does it, uh, are we really benefiting from that or can we just go ahead and have discussion for another four or five, you know, uh, it takes some time and have, more discussion and then adopt a 2021 code or whatever it needs to be. Because, because you know, I, I need to do my homework. A, a couple of, five or six, a couple of months ago, when we, we were talking about some building code things, and I said, Council, we really need to make sure we do our homework on this code stuff so we don't run into a goofy situation like we had with concrete, okay? And so now that's biting me on the backside because, you know, Council Member Jenrich, you really need to do your homework on this issue. And I haven't done it. So I need more information yeah, before I, I move forward. Mm -hmm. and, I need and more I, information. You, you on know, both. and I. On, on both, on both yes. topics? Yes. Okay. Um, anybody? More info. More info? Yep. All right. Yes. Yeah, I almost said Council Member Hartman. <laughs> 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 Welcome. Okay, Mike Hartman with the fire department. Uh, just a couple of things as you're, as you're discussing, uh, a few things I want to kind of help clarify, kind of toss out there on the fire code end of things. Uh, number one, the historic building. Yes, that, that's part of the state code. Uh, I have not delved into it very deeply. My, my first view of it is it <coughs> looks like it wouldn't do a whole lot for us, but as far as looking at that as an option, you know, obviously we're, we're open for anything. Right now, uh, one thing to keep in mind, with that, it refers back to the IEBC Chapter 11, or Chapter 12, I think it is, Historic Buildings. So we already have something in place in the existing building code that deals with historic buildings. Uh, as far as trying to hold off on updating uh, to the 2021, a couple of things with that. You, you were concerned about the state fire marshal is still on the 2015 code. Little insight to that. They have been trying to go to the 21 for at least two, I believe, three years. The reason they haven't, they didn't do it this year, because during this session, 
uh, state government re was reorganized. So it was in a pr improper for them to try to change something that may or may not be in their area of expertise. Last year, uh, kind of the same thing happened. There was discussion of reorganizing state government, so they held off on trying to get that approval process. But they've been trying for, for a couple mm -hmm. of years. A few other things with that. Uh, the, the 2015, as far as, as certification, uh, it is old enough that the International Code Council, I cannot be certified, I cannot have one of our new guys be certified as a fire inspector for the 2015 code. It's no longer there. Uh, it's, it's just too old. Uh, for the fire code. We're yes, about for the, the fire code. We're talking about I'm, the building code today, though. Right. Our topic today is the right. building code. Yes, but I, I'm trying to give you oh, some insight. I just insight want people to be confused that. that we won't be able to certify people to do inspections if we don't change the building code. There is a sunset on the building code certifications as well. Sure. Okay. All right. So the, that, that is one concern I have. Uh, if you're talking about holding off and adopting the, the 21 code, you just talked about solar, uh, solar installations. The 2015 code requires a lot more things for your homeowner that has solar as far as access, how much space you can have, uh, where you can put the panels, all that kind of stuff. Over the years, they've learned from it, and they have loosened up a lot of the requirements. And that, that's an example of solar. I think there are some other, other items with that as well. Uh, another thing as far as uh, the batteries. Batteries is a, <laughs> a fairly uh, topical topic, if you will. Uh, the Stanley Center for, for Peace, uh, they have brand new batteries. They have, they have new, new technology there. Uh, the 2015 code does not address anything with that because the technology is too new. If we stayed with the 2015, we cannot address what we're seeing in the community now. Uh, so there, those are a few other things to keep in mind. Okay, um, I'd, like to, and, I'd, I'd like to speak to that, though. And, and I can go ahead and, and go around and do some, some uh, checking to see what other jurisdictions are on as far as the, the, the code cycle and all that. I know fire code, I have a, a pretty good idea. Um, most everybody is on the 18 or moving to the 21. Not everybody has. Um, but I'm not sure about the, the building code or the other codes. I can only speak to the fire okay. code. Uh, Dubuque, you brought up Dubuque. Dubuque is on the 21 code already for that. What do they, well, that's another topic. I think we're making this into a conversation of 21 versus 15. That's not my proposal. I'm not arguing against the 21 code. My, my second request, its only advantage is that if Iowa adopts it, they are also going to probably update their historic code chapter and it would keep us from doing that work. Now, if we adopt the 2015 historic chapter early now, feel free to, when we adopt the 21 code, to also change that historic chapter as well. Move forward with the 21 code, but the only advantage is you know, why have Muscatine do that work and the state of Iowa do that work? You know, maybe there's some synergy where the state of Iowa would do that and then we just adopt what they did right. again. And, and and again honestly, not, I, but I I'm know. not arguing against the 21 code. There are advantages to it. I see them. Right. But I also am not going to approve any changes that don't address some of the issues we've been having with our historic properties. We have a very strong will to in this community to save our historic properties. We get complaints all the time that we're letting them fall down, demoing them, mm -hmm. and all these other things. Um, and we're just continue to fail to, to do anything about that. So yeah, I guess we've got some success stories with, with H&I and the McKee Button Factory, but we also have these small 1,000 square foot stores downtown that continue to go vacant and it wasn't just two years ago we had the back end of one of them fall down into the alley because it's empty. That's dangerous. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to the original, so it seems like the consensus is to gather more information. Is that still accurate then? Yes. How are we going to do that though? Is each of us going to do that on our own like we have been or are we going to try and bring in somebody to sure. help us through this? So the specific issue is related to historic buildings and and feeling like the, the state has adopted something that is substantially, substantially addresses that concern. Just because the state has it, rather than relying on the state to continue to do that, 
we can go through the cup. We can go through these pieces. And like, if you feel like these pieces that they've deleted are the key pieces to delete to make historic preservation, the preservation of historic buildings successful, we can come back and tell you what all of those are in the local code. We can, we can actually outline, but this is what haven't. section 101.5 means. I made that specific request already. And, and no, since before but I today we got this and this is what you said was successful. So in this, they're adopting, they're, they're using the international existing building code. We can go back and find the 2021 version of what this is and I make haven't changed my request since before April. This is what I requested before April for staff to look at in that meeting. Okay, I apologize all. if I did not see section 350 ever, that I did, I did not know this. I have not retained my request for months. I know you've asked for historic stuff. This for specific that. And that's what I'm saying is I'm, I'm not arguing, I'm just saying I did not, I did not rec I did not hear this number, this state reference. So I'm sorry that we missed that. But we can do that. We can go through and look at it and be like, this is what it means in the 2021. This is in the existing, in the inert, <laughs> existing building code for 2021. This is what that would be. And if it gets to where, so that so the, we have something that's comparable to this state code. I hope we can do better than that. I've been looking for better than even that, but at least this gets the ball rolling. Um, but I have asked for this since before, I don't know, when was that meeting we had with all of you in the room, with Carol in the room? I, I cited that document and asked for, how does this compare on the 2021 code? And I still don't have that answer. So, Senator Spare, what did you have? Well, we, we have talked about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've talked about it at length. Uh, I told you that it, that it really didn't make many changes, and that is absolutely true. I did not know you were asking for a line-by-line line dictated what's the difference here. I'm asking here. for something that addresses the issues we're having. If this sparks the conversation, back in so it, I think, back I think in what you were going to do, you guys, but let's, let's pause. Let's pause and let's gather some more information and let's, Senator Stewart Webb, does that sound? Yeah, um, so I think what Councilmember Osborne asked for on a high level, Andy did do. He looked at what is, what is dictated in the state historic code and what's been deleted or changed. So it's not that much as far as the actual requirements. If you want us to go back and go through it specifically, we can do that, absolutely. Um, if we're looking for recommendations beyond that, I would need more information as to what. Okay. What are you looking for? So we can certainly, when you say get more information, we can do that. It um, seems like that's the consensus yes. of most of the council. Is that, so, is that okay with the council? Yes. To and I think that would inform council as do you want to do something as far as adoption of the state code or do you just want to work within our existing code? Is there something within our existing code that we need to do? The other part I'm hearing is that you want to wait until after we talk to the contractors with the substantive changes book to reconsider adopting the 2021 codes. So we will plan a work, an in-depth discussion uh, you know, I'll have to talk to the team about how long this work might take. I know their meeting is end of June, so we might be looking in at the in depth in September, probably. So, as council, yeah. is the consensus okay to wait until after mm -hmm. the meeting with the contractors? Mm -hmm. Yes, the majority. Can I ask just to make sure the other items that we've discussed beyond the historic buildings? Do, are we hitting the mark on those items? Are you, or I'm just making sure that we're headed in the right direction with some of those other issues. I think so. I mean, can we go back to that slide? Because I mean, you're having discussions. We need continued discussions and start checking things off, like the discussion about the planning and zoning appeals and things like that. I think yeah, the appeals and these changes. Um, yeah. The adoption of a, an appeals board is independent of right. the code adoption, so we but can other... start anal like, just like we did with nuisance appeal. It would be a similar type of evaluation. Um, I think we would it would require a code change to do this. So it would it might be difficult to do it on a trial basis unless we did like a um, 
you know, a temporary right. code. Yeah, but we if, could But do if that. we look at these things, like they're required for engineering, I think that's going to be a positive change that the contractors are going to like. So you've gone through and listened to some of the critical issues, and I think move for my recommendation, this is nothing, you know, move forward with the ones you can impact. We have a lot of discussion left on the historical and then the adoption of the new code. But this start taking some of those things off because we've been stale for too long and now we've got some momentum. And I think that's the direction as we wanna see this keep moving forward, so. So am I, just to make sure I understand, you, you are giving us direction to, to do more research on a building appeals board. Am I right about that? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> From before, it seemed like everybody was okay. With yes. Well, the majority. No majority. decision. We'll come bring it back in an in depth. If you if you don't like the idea, I mean, like we did with nuisance, no no problem there. Um, and then, what about the items on the last slide? I mean, we I know this is feedback, and I I just while we're talking about this, thanking the contractors and the stakeholders for coming to that meeting and giving us some very valuable input. Mm -hmm. Again, some of these things aren't code related, but they're things that we think are good um, yeah, recommendations and things that we want to work on. So we can also create a feedback loop to report back to council on some of the, that I work. I mean, if you went to that contractor's meeting and said, we listened to you, and on this part, we've identified these, and we think we're in agreement, we can make that change. I think that's going to be very positive feedback from them. But there's still other things to check off. Just request. My I mean, other decisions, but if we start removing these and, you know. My feedback is we haven't sufficiently addressed the, the really high priority issues that was said in that meeting around historic properties. Okay, but this, these are important to the contractors on day-to-day -day commercial and residential business. That's the majority of their business. So they're gonna see this as a positive, I think. That's just my opinion. Historical is another subset of what they do. Could I? Yes. Uh, can all of our contractors be sent those six items before the 28th meeting so that they can tell us whether or not they agree with these or has it already been sent to them? Have they already had a chance? It's, we like could talk to them that. on the 28th though. That's a good Pardon idea. Me? I think that's a good idea. We could bring these items to the meeting on the 28th and say, these are the things, this is what we heard at the meeting, these are the things we'll be addressing. Does this resonate with you? I think that's, that's and we'll have them gather there anyway, so that works. Yeah, I think, you know, send it out. Let's get some feedback on those six things. I mean, you know, I'd like to see that because I don't fully understand all the ramifications of those six items, but the people who are doing the professional contract mm -hmm. work Thank do. You. And if, if, you know, a vast majority of uh, contractors complain to me about, you know, I don't, I don't know, that 200 amp electrical service, that makes sense to me. Otherwise, you know, power, but GFI, the other things, you know. I, I've said enough. I think we, those should be sent, and we should get some response from contractors by the 28th on those items. Is there any other? Is that what, is that what I'm you're that just? Yep, we can yeah, do that. That sounds good. Is there any other feedback from council? before we move on to the next topic. Again, six items are identified up there, and I agree with those items were, were the feedback. But requirements for engineering, basically we're still gonna use the same matrix that we have been using. There's really not a huge change there. Applicability of residential sprinklers, that was basically one entity that gave a lot of that feedback, and we, and, and we are intimately aware with that. State of Iowa did that, we didn't. Removing laundry from GFSI, GFCI requirements. There's no real actionable happening due to this conversation. But the the thing is, we're going to consider that later. That's that's what our response is. We're going to consider that later in other code. Removing 200 amp service. Nope, not going to do that. Established an appeals board. That's probably about the only thing on that list that is significant. Obviously, number six, I've already stated I disagree that we've done anything with that. So that's my feedback. If, if I could ask for some clarification, uh, saying we need more information, that's a pretty broad stroke. Uh, I would invite any of you, all of you, 
to email me a list of your questions or any piece of information that you don't feel that you've gotten from our discussions, and I'll be glad to answer those. Does that sound I can, okay, I can respond That's fair to, to, you know, whole or in part or individual, however you'd prefer. That sounds great, Andrew. I would, I will definitely look forward to those. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your we, feedback. Any of that, I would want all the council to see. So we can collect that and make sure all the council is caught. I don't want any council member to have more information than another. So we'll make sure everybody has all of that info. Sounds great. All right. And now we'll do an overview of crime-free multi-housing program. Okay, so I'm Nicole Sink. Um, I'm a detective with the Street Crimes Unit here in Muscatine. Uh, this is Lieutenant Vince Motto. Um, the past few months, we've been, both been working together on this crime-free multi-housing program. Um, so the program consists, whoops, sorry. There we go. It was not. You might want to put it in slideshow yeah. mode. That might help. <laughs> bottom right it's like the second icon on the bottom from the right to the right a little one more right there clearly there I don't go. do these often <laughs> she's on the street working and uh, <laughs> playing with presentations <laughs> Thank you. Okay. can we get a chalkboard <laughs> <laughs> so the program consists of three different phases I'll go into detail about those in a little bit um, the main goals of this program is to reduce crime, gang activity, and drug activity within the community and just overall make the community a safer place. Um, we also want to build a stronger working relationship with our landlords and property owners. I would say prior to this um, program being put in place, uh, we never really had contact with our landlords and property owners. I mean, we would occasionally be in contact with them, but ever since I started doing this, I'm in contact with the landlords and property owners weekly. Some of them, I'm in contact with them daily. They're texting me, even call me when I'm not working, which is sometimes inconvenient, <laughs> but um, we're working through that. Um, but I think it's great that we now have this stronger working relationship with them. Um, they've kind of built trust in me and uh, things are getting done um, sometimes on the street when there's trespass issues or whatever other issues come across in their property they have to call dispatch an officer has to try to find that person to trespass them uh, sometimes it could take a week or two for us to find that person to trespass um, now they've been just sending me lists of people that they don't want on their property because they've been causing issues I've been able to just go track them down myself versus it being uh, pushed out to a week or two so I know that they're pretty appreciative about that. And another goal is to just provide resources to these landlords and property owners. Um, we're not here to give legal advice, but we're just helping them with the resources to make their properties a safer place. Um, if they have questions about uh, housing or writs or evictions, I can point them in the right direction and give them contacts. So a little bit about the history of the program. It was developed in 1992 at the Mesa, Arizona Police Department. Uh, since then, this program has spread over 2,000 different cities in the United States. Um, in Iowa, there is at least 20 different departments that have implemented this into their police departments. Ankeny, West Des Moines, Urbandale, Cedar Rapids, Dubuque. Some actually even make uh, the first phase of this program mandatory. I used to work in Dubuque and um, I recently just found out that Dubuque does make this first phase of the program mandatory and I'll explain why they probably made that mandatory in a little bit. Uh, there's multiple different types of the crime-free housing, I mean, rental, houses, rental properties, uh, apartment complexes, townhouses, mobile home parks, it can even spread out to storage units and hotels. 
Um, I don't have much data to show you guys right now, but um, I've done some research in fully certified properties. So once they complete all three phases, uh, data has shown that their calls for services at these properties have reduced by 70%. So the first phase of this program is the management training. Um, it's an eight hour course. Um, in order to be a part of this program, you do have to attend the eight hour course. Uh, our first training session was on Friday, May 12th. Um, we held the training session at the library here in town. Um, who attends this training? Uh, landlords, property owners, uh, maintenance guys, basically whoever is associated with the property. I know we had a lot of issues with uh, some of the property owners or landlords. They were out of town or doing other things. They were able to just send a maintenance worker or somebody else that was associated with their property to attend. Um, and then they were just relaying that information to their property owner or I followed up with the property owner and kind of gave them the lowdown of what uh, went on at the training. Uh, we had, I believe, 18 people attend our first training. Uh, we had 35 sign up. Unfortunately, not everybody showed up, but we got more people than we expected to show up. Uh, the training is a, about a variety of different topics. Um, we kind of gave a brief introduction of what the crime-free housing program was. We had help from Urbandale Police Department and West Des Moines as well, just because we were new to this and we just kind of wanted to see how they um, present the training to the, uh, their people in their town and just kind of got some tips from them. We had uh, Michelle Brandt come down and talk about applicant screening and background checks as well as Section 8 housing and fair housing. She's a state certified trainer and she goes around to all different police departments in Iowa and specifically educates landlords and property owners on those topics, mainly because we don't really have much knowledge on those kind of things versus her. She was very knowledgeable in those aspects and gave out quite a few handouts to the landlords and property owners. Um, eviction process and writs. Uh, we had um, the Civil Department here in Muscatine as well as the Muscatine County Sheriff's Office come and do a little presentation on those topics. I thought this was pretty informational for the landlords because most of the time in the city um, they reach out to the police department with questions about the eviction process because they think we handle it since their property is in the city. but. Realistically, we don't deal with that. It's the sheriff's office that's dealing with it. So they were given a bunch of handouts and they were able to present a bunch of questions to the civil office and to the Muscatine County Sheriff's Office, which cleared up a lot of things for them. And now they have contact information for those guys if they come across questions. Um, safety and prevention. We had the fire department uh, do a little presentation on that. Uh, that was kind of just basic safety in the household. Um, making sure you're talking to your tenants, letting them know where uh, fire extinguishers are, just basic safety and prevention stuff in the household. Um, we talked about combating illegal activity and crime prevention. Uh, we talked about drugs, paraphernalia, gangs, um, basically what that all entails and how to report it to us. Uh, lease agreements, we had a civil attorney come in he was from Cedar Rapids and he basically just talked about any legal questions that our audience had for them which is quite a few and now he's a point of contact for them if they have any uh, legal questions because we don't give out legal advice for that so and then the crime free addendum Yeah, you can hold that around and I can pass these two paper forms around. I'll take a look at those. I'll be your Vanna White. <laughs> <laughs> so this is basically what uh, the program is based around. It's a crime-free addendum. Um, I'm not going to read it word for word, but <clears throat> he's holding one example, and then I passed around a couple other examples. Um, basically, this says tenants shall not engage in criminal activity, including drug-related criminal activity, including guests of the tenants. Um, like I said, this is just an example, but we want to make sure that landlords are having this kind of stuff in their leases so that way we can do something about uh, the criminal activity that's happening at these places. Um, we really strive to suggest that 
criminal or make sure they're defining criminal activity and drug activity in these leases, um, especially the guests of the tenants. We always get called to apartment complexes or rental houses because the guests are causing issues. Well, then it kind of ties our hands because then they say, well, this person's been living here for five months and he's not on the lease. Well, then that kind of becomes a problem. So if this is in your lease, then you can do something about it. Um, here's an example. So say we get called out to an apartment for a guy. He's drunk and causing problems at the apartment. He goes to the jail. Uh, we talk to the landlord, let him know what happened. They can go off their lease and evict him if they want, but they also have the right to keep him around at the apartment complex if they wish. But if it happens five more times in the next month, then we're gonna have to have a sit down conversation with the landlord and be like, hey, you're not complying with the program. You can either go through the eviction process or we can just take you out of the program and you'll no longer be a part of the crime-free housing program. So. We're just providing resources to these landlords and it's up to them if they wanna participate or not. I've been doing uh, weekly and monthly reports with the landlords. So basically I just go through all of our calls for service. I provide incidents of all the calls that we've had, let them know if anybody's getting arrested. And basically it's in their hands as to whether or not they want to evict these people. And then I'm just following up with them to see what progress has been made. So these are all the phase one certified properties. Um, all these people or that were associated with these properties attended on May 12th. Um, it might just look like there's 15 or 20 names up here, but realistically with all the properties that they own, uh, there's probably at least 75 to 125 different units that we're in charge of and that are phase one certified. So this is the second phase of the program, which is what we're starting now, um, which is basically a security assessment. I'll go up to the property. I'll, ins I'll inspect the doors, windows, lighting, surveillance, um, the basic landscaping of their properties. I'll go over with them what I think should be improved, what's good. Um, we realize that these things are expensive. Some of these things can be fixed within a day or two, we get that. Um, for example, if there's a broken window, it shouldn't take six months to repair that. Uh, criminals see that as an easy target and they know if people don't fix their things, they don't care about things and their criminal activity is just gonna keep happening. So. For a broken window, we do expect that to get fixed, but for surveillance, um, for example, the apartments out at 1816 and 2002 Logan, uh, we get quite a few calls up there. They do have surveillance, but the past few years hasn't been the best. Uh, sometimes some of the buildings just, they weren't working. So we've had conversations out there and they actually are putting up new cameras within two weeks. So technically that's gonna be a phase two certification based on they've been making improvements. Um, so overall, we're just looking for improvements over time based on, I guess, a list of things that we go through. And then next, oh, actually, going back to phase two, I can pass around a survey, kind of what I'll bring up to the apartments and it's kind of like my checklist if you guys want to take a look at those. And then phase three is the safety social. So this is basically just a small gathering. It can be a picnic. It can be whatever the landlord or property owner wants it to be. As long as law enforcement is there present, um, they get the phase three certification. Basically, this is just so that the tenants, property owners, and law enforcement can all be together. It helps them build trust with us. Um, it's kind of just a little celebration for, hey, we're a crime-free housing unit, and basically we're just there. It can be educational or not. We can bring the canine officer up there. He can do demonstrations with his dog. We can bring the fire department up there. Uh, they can teach tenants about CPR, or it doesn't have to be educational at all. Um, obviously, we want to, we would like to make it educational and kind of 
base things off the program, but it doesn't have to be. And then we also could teach the tenants about paraphernalia, drugs, and gangs, just like we did with the landlords in phase one training, just so that not only are the landlords aware of what's going on with the properties, but if the tenants see drugs or if the tenants see gang activity, they can contact me and that way we know what's going on up there. And then this is just stuff that we would share with them, what paraphernalia looks like, uh, what to do if you see it. Obviously needles, you don't wanna touch those. Uh, we talk about the different drugs here in town. Methamphetamine is our most common drug. It's a white crystal-like substance. So we just would like to educate uh, the tenants on what drugs look like and what to do if they see it. And then gang activity as well. It used to be a big problem here. A lot of our gang members are currently locked up, but eventually they'll all be getting out. So it's just nice to make our community aware of gang members in town, what they wear. Um, they're known to wear black and yellow. Um, if you see them with crowns or lions, tattoos or shirts, it most likely means that they're part of the Latin Kings and we have over 15 documented Latin Kings here in Muscatine. So it's just an educational thing for them. And then after the completion of all three phases, uh, the landlords and property owners get to hang up this sign whether it's at the office door or wherever, the welcome sign, wherever they want to hang this out at. Um, we'd also like to... <laughs> we would also like to possibly get this up on the city's website, um, information about the program, and then possibly get a list of all the certified properties here in Muscatine. Um, that's how I basically found out about all these other departments. I just went to their city website and they had their own section for crime-free housing and I had a list of all their properties that were certified. Um, so after the certification, they'll just continue to do this each year. We'll go through phase two again and they'll have a social again. If they don't wanna keep doing phase two and phase three, then they just won't be certified anymore. They'll just be certified that one time and if they wanna continue in the program, then they'll have to continue with the phase two and phase three. And uh, there's a bunch of benefits to this program, but the main ones I think uh, are just making the community a safer place by reducing the drugs, gang activity, um, advertisement for the landlords, property owners, and overall they just get a better tenant base, um, reduce repair costs, they don't have to keep fixing things and increase property value. That concludes. That would, uh just to kind of expand on what Nicole was saying, uh, the idea behind this program was essentially in looking at uh, the amount of rental properties in, in the Muscatine area and in the Muscatine jurisdiction. Move, move closer oh, to the mic. The public can't hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me now? I I better. Okay. <laughs> um, was that there was a significant amount of rental properties within the Muscatine area and from those rental properties, there was an equally significant amount of criminal activity that came from them. Uh, we looked at that problem and said, how can we eliminate that or reduce that as much as possible? We came across this program, and what's really unique and uh, kind of neat about it is, is it's, a, it's a case that it's a benefit both to the police department as well as to the property owners. On the one hand, we get the intelligence we get the opportunity to uh, eliminate as much criminal activity as possible. And on their, on their side of things, they have a better idea of how to remove bad, bad actors within uh, their properties, uh, bring in better tenants, bring in more money, uh, and generally know what to do uh, when they're having issues. Uh, and by having Nicole be their conduit and move them in the right direction. Again, they can use these signs and put them in on their properties. That alone in and of itself has proven to be in, some, in uh, many jurisdictions to be a deterrent. Uh, if you are someone who is looking to find a place to utilize as potentially a drug house and you see that on the driveway as you come in, you're probably going to look somewhere else. Uh, so most, that would be, is again, being a unique program and as it benefits us and it benefits uh, the landowner, or excuse me, the rental property owners as well. Um, just to show even uh, as we are getting in kind of the infancy and beginnings of this, but uh, what was it yesterday? Uh, NCO violation? 
there was a property owner that got a hold of Nikki now that they have a direct conduit with the police department to say that there was a active violation of a no contact boarding order going on on one of the properties she immediately was able to find the information find where the uh, no contact order was involved with get officers location and arrest was made uh, and through the uh, the addendum that we have the that is uh, provided uh, that is a reason or could be a reason that the land uh, the property owners could remove that tenant so we're giving them that opportunity to not only have information but to help them police their own properties and make them better for themselves. So again, I think a really unique opportunity for both uh, the community and the department. Council Member Gordon. <laughs> great program. Awesome. Great amount of work. Um, if you get to that level three, is there an opportunity for the landlords to give you at least an idea of how many of their tenants have signed the agreement, the lease agreement? Because they're not going to be able to do that overnight. It's going to take a period of time as they go through that. But that might be a nice metric to have to say, you guys are at 60% great job type thing. Yeah, and I'm actually making sure that all that's happening before we give them the certification because I don't think it's fair to give them the certification when I don't even know if they've been abiding by the crime-free addendum. So I've been keeping track of basically everything that's been happening. Um, I've been following up with them to see if they're evicting people, if they're not. Um, I've talked to a couple landlords already. They've told me that people are signing their lease. I've talked to other landlords that are showing me their lease that has the stuff already in it. So I guess there's multiple ways to go about it. It's just whether or not the landlords are following through with it, I should say, so. No, great work. I mean, it's gonna, the residents that wanna be safe will feel safer. Yeah. Hopefully it'll be a deterrent for those people that don't care. Yeah. So good job. Thank you. Councilmember Osborne. Oh, sorry. Is there anything that we can do as council to help support and send this carrot or stick it type of thing? Um, I know that it's great that folks are volunteering for this. Uh, some of them will. Um, I think some of the language that I saw passed around is fairly standard for a lease. A lot of them probably already have similar things like don't don't break you know don't use my property to break any crimes because mm -hmm. potentially I would lose that if it gets seized in a drug operation. Um, so there's incentives like that already built in. But is there anything that you can think of that we can do to help? Um, I would say at this point we're I would just ask to help spread the word. Uh, we we're going to be utilizing obviously the, the city's website, social media platforms to get the word out as much as we can. It's something that uh, as, as you can see is not going to be done overnight uh, and we will hold multiple uh, uh, step one meetings uh, throughout the course of the year so I, I think at this point uh, it just help us get the word out if you could okay. uh, again just to kind of give you an idea of where it has gone as far as in some cities I think you kind of touched on it a little bit is actually written into their city code that may be something down the road to look for we, we'd like to have this be a voluntary situation first and hopefully uh, get some support from the current property owners to incentivize the coming in property owners to stay with it But uh, it can kind of go whatever direction council would want uh, Eventually so again, at this point. I, I appreciate it sir, uh, but I think we just get uh, your help in getting the word spread That'll well, I think be the, good. the timing is good. I mean the rental market out there is pretty tight uh, you know property owners have their selection of multiple tenants and they can be choiceful and I'm sure they're going to be willing to sign these leases. And I think that uh, even though this, it's been a couple months since we got this going, um, it's not going as fast as other departments because they have a full-time officer doing this. He's second ship supervisor on patrol and I'm doing street crimes detective work. So together we're trying to do the best we can at speeding things up. But I think... Oh. Yeah, that could end it. <laughs> Could you give us two hundred thousand dollars for <laughs> a couple more? No, all right, very good. Uh, we are actually less at, uh, We are actually looking at some different grant opportunities uh, that we will probably bring to council going forward uh, to help maybe fund this position in a more time full full time capacity. Uh, again, not to to be clear, other agencies of our size um, are doing it in kind of a part time position, but it does make it. It is a lot of work that Nikki has done. I, I constantly tell her how appreciative of it is because she has done a very a yeoman's work on it. So 
Uh, but that is something that we may look at doing or hopefully maybe can do. It'd be a great opportunity for someone within the department as well, be it Nikki or by that time maybe she's chief. I don't know. Uh, so, oh, sorry, Tony, didn't see you there. Uh, but uh, it would be a good opportunity for an officer to bring in and, and a good uh, position to have for the department. Well, don't be shy about asking for the help you need. Um, okay. That request goes through that guy right there. He decides whether we want to have a full-time officer or not, and if that requires a budget adjustment, then we'll bring that forward. All right, thank you, sir. Detective Sink, wonderful job with the presentation, by the way. Thank you. And great job holding the sign up there as well. Thank you, sir. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you so much. Next item is D, is public art overview and recommendations. All right, hello. Let's see if I can get this uh, squared away here. That's a great program. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. My vision isn't too good from far away. All righty. Um, I am Melanie Alexander. I'm director of the Muscatine Art Center, but I am also one of two city staff liaisons to the Public Art Advisory Commission. Um, the Public Art Advisory Commission is, um, I believe, the newest for the city of Muscatine. It was established on July 1st of 2019, so we've been in existence for less than four years. Um, I want to take a moment to uh, introduce a couple of our um, uh, advisory commission members. Jim Elias and uh, Carolyn Levine are here in the room. Um, they are both among the original group who started back in 2019. Um, and Carolyn actually predates that with some study we did uh, ahead in advance of actually establishing the advisory commission. Uh, Bob Alby and ba Brad Roth are not able to join us, but they were, they've also served um, ever since the foundation of the group. And then Thalia um, Sutton is our newest uh, Public Art Advisory Commission member. Uh, so we thought we'd start with um, kind of a spotlight on some of the art that you will see around Muscatine. Some of it is on city property and some of it um, is on private property. Uh, our, our real sort of purpose is to help make decisions for um, property that belongs to the city of Muscatine. Um, but I'll have uh, Jim kind of walk us through that. Let's see. Oops. Let's see next there. All right. There. Yeah. There we go. All right. Good evening. Uh, thanks, Melanie. Uh, I'm Jim Elias. I've been a member of the Public Art Advisory Commission since its inception. Uh, in 2006, 17 years ago, was uh, Muscatine installed a really uh, impressive piece of public art down on a riverfront in Riverside Park. Uh, Mississippi Harvest, the statue or the sculpture on the far right, stands sentinel over, over a city, and my hope is that he will be watchful over much more uh, artistic and cultural endeavors within our city. Uh, so I'm going to, the next few slides, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, just kind of highlight some of the art that we have, either public art or art in public spaces. Uh, this slide shows three statues or sculptures that we have um, on public, public property. This slide shows uh, a number of murals that we have throughout the city. Uh, all of these are on private property. And you will, some, you, I'm sorry, the, the one in the center, the lady on the scaffolding is public property. That's, that's the tennis court at Weed Park. Um, if you're familiar with some of these, you will know that, that many of these murals around town have faded and maybe fallen in some disrepair. Uh, so that's, that's a, an issue that, that we believe the Public Art Advisory Commission needs to uh, at least have on our plate somehow for the city. 
uh, we have the Muscatine County Arts Council in 2016, I believe, they launched their Wandering Words program. So throughout the city, there are a number of poems sculpted into public sidewalks. So that's a pretty cool project. Uh, these are a couple of things that are art in public spaces. The, the Muscatine Power and Water owned water tower, of course, that was an engagement with the city where they asked folks to submit ideas for what kind of art we're going to have on the new water, or not the new water tower, but repainted it. Uh, and so that's an example there. Uh, the Stanley Consultants Building, that's a private property and it's privately owned sculpture by Stanley Consultants, but that's at the corner of uh, Iowa and 3rd Street, so that's in public space. Of course, we have the, the bridge, uh, which not everyone may consider that to be art, but the way that it's lit and the way we use it, it's, it's quite, a, quite an iconic thing for our community. Uh, we've had a number of, of kind of rotating or temporary installations. This was uh, actually the summer that the Public Art Advisory Commission was founded. Uh, we, we started this and we had this six months, was it in town? It wasn't even a full year. Full year, yeah. yeah. Uh, David Hayes is a, is a world-renowned sculptor and his son, David Hayes, was the, is kind of the uh, steward of this collection and we had a handful of David Hayes uh, steel sculptures throughout the city. Most of those were placed in on public land. I mean, we had one out in front of City Hall, um, Discovery Park, places like that. Uh, and this is the, the newest piece of sculpture installed at the Art Center. And again, so that, this, this is uh, certainly public art because it's, owned on, it's on public city-owned property at the Art Center. Uh, it's also um, art in public spaces owned by kind of a private collection in that the Muscatine Art Center has its own collection. So it, it is kind of a hybrid thing for what we're doing. But, but this really kind of highlights a lot of the types of uh, art that we have around the community. And I think that's going to, I'm going to let Melanie just kind of fill you in on what we've been up to and give some recommendations. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, and in the remainder of the slide presentation, you will see some other examples. There's uh, lots of sculpture that's part of um, the zoo garden at Weed Park, of course, and there's additional murals and other, other things. So this is just sort of a sampling to remind us all what we currently have in our community. So I want to first um, begin by the um, processes that have been managed by the Public Art Advisory Commission um, since it was founded in, in 2019. Um, so I'm gonna talk first about two projects and both of these were identified by leadership within the city of um, Muscatine. So there was um, other city staff, department heads who were interested in art for the roundabout at Mulberry and Second. And then there was also interest in art on the retaining walls along the trail um, on Hauser. So that's where we sort of took our direction was there was, there was interest in moving on um, those um, particular locations. So um, we ran, and of course this was peak COVID. Um, I think we launched this in November of 2020, looking for organizations interested in painting murals because we have no money for public art. Um, so the idea was to involve organizations and, and um, have them um, select their own artists and, and fund much of their project. Um, so we have um, Janet uh, 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 Hoops um, 
working on the uh, mural for Fairport Fish Hatchery on Hauser and Hershey. Um, she did the first round of that mural in 2021, and then she um, did another, a second round in 2022. And I think they're going to come back at a later time. They had an idea for how to complete that. Um, that's the, the longest chunk of um, the retaining wall on, on Hauser. Um, I believe they'll be coming back to us with some ideas for how to finish that off, but it will probably be a 2024 project. Um, and we did have some funding that came through the community development office to cover the supplies for paint and for sealing that mural. And that was, um, those murals were reviewed by the Public Art Advisory Commission. Uh, we also looked at applications from other organizations and uh, uh, were able to move forward with the fish hatchery project. So in the other uh, piece for the roundabout, we did a request for qualifications, and this was also in November of 2020, and it was somewhat of a pivot because I had um, secured a grant to run the Idea Dash, which in 2020 was not a possibility. We couldn't gather in, in public at that time, and so instead we broke up that grant to create three separate stipends for um, artists to uh, work on their concepts for the um, sculpture for a proposal for the roundabout. Um, so we went through a process of looking for qualifications. Um, we had 17 different artists respond to that, and then the Public Art Advisory Commission selected three, and then those three artists um, developed concepts. And so then once we, we um, received their um, concepts along with what the costs were going to be, what the maintenance concerns were going to be, um, and then images of, of what their project was, and then we had the public vote on it. Um, it was kind of a lengthy process uh, with both online voting or in-person voting, either at um, the, the library, the art center, or at um, Jim's uh, Sunrise Gallery. So we um, did a survey monkey and um, collected all sorts of feedback about it. And um, the, far, the, the, the preference was um, for Zenith, which was by the artist um, Nathan Pierce. Um, so let's see, 50% um, of survey per participants selected that as their um, top choice. And then we also collected feedback on what, what people thought would be their second choice. Um, so we made that recommendation to, oh, to city council and um, we've been in the process of kind of trying to fund that project, <coughs> trying to um, get the engineering work done for the concrete um, foundation for the sculpture, um, and then funding what's needed for the, for the foundation. Um, and I believe it will be on the council agenda for next week. So um, now getting back to that original idea of the idea dash, we were finally able to hold that in November of 2021, and we did both an online session, kind of a hybrid approach, where there was a an online session in the morning on that day, and then an in-person meeting at the rendezvous. And we um, gathered everybody's thoughts. It was kind of a fun brainstorming competition thing where people worked in teams, trying to generate ideas about how to, how to um, you know, improve um, I guess the quality of life in terms of what's culturally available here in Muscatine. Uh, and we had a, a good turnout uh, for participation both online and in person. And we collected a lot of ideas. Um, those are all documented. Um, and it gave us some idea of what, what folks who were really interested in the arts, what they were thinking here in Muscatine. So um, we did have the idea dash and um, that also led us into uh, writing our recommendations for what to do next for public art. 
So here are those recommendations. These were just adopted by the Public Art Advisory Commission and that group meets quarterly. So it is not holding monthly meetings, um, but we have you know, continued to work on things behind the scenes for some time. And I'm gonna start with sort of the low cost, no cost types of things that we can um, continue to move forward with. So creating a database of the existing public art installations and whatever information we can collect about that in terms of you know, who, who's behind the project, um, when it was done, who was the artist, uh, and we'd have some catching up to do because you know, we don't necessarily have all those records for everything that's around town. Um, we wanna build and promote a virtual tour of public art installations, um, work with city leadership to identify additional locations where we could possibly um, do public art installations. Uh, we wanna finalize the application and review process for gifting public art to the city. Um, we worked with a draft document for the uh, watermelon uh, project. Um, continuation of recommendations. Um, we want to determine the need for a mural uh, policy. So if there's input from city council, if you feel that's something um, that we need to look at other Communities in Iowa do have a mural policy um, that is often reviewed by their public art um, committee or commission. Um, we also wanna create some rules regarding temporary or permanent modifications to public art owned by the city of Muscatine. Um, build a broader network of artists, arts educators, patrons, and other supporters to increase support for public art, develop it partnerships to um, help bring more public art projects um, through the process and hopefully eventually on to city property. Uh, continue community engagement to obtain feedback and also help generate some enthusiasm for public art projects. Uh, continue to bring forward uh, best practices by studying programs and projects undertaken in other communities or uh, you know, as presented through say the National Endowment for the Arts or other arts, federal arts organizations. Um, complete the Mulberry and Second Roundabout Project. And then, um, this, this slide is the um, piece that, you know, we really would need more from city leadership here. So securing a regular funding mechanism for building upon and maintaining Muscatine's collection of public art, de determining the path for developing a public art master plan for the city of Muscatine, evaluate the feasibility, whether there's financial support and available staff resources for implementing, um, you know, any of the, uh, the suggestions that were um, generated during the idea dash or any other, you know, conversations that are taking place in the community around public art. And finally, I'll conclude with just, um, you know, if, if we really want to become a community that has a great public <coughs> art program, cultural events, basis for cultural gatherings, um, then we need to have some sort of infrastructure to support that, to support the management of a public art program, um, and to really designate staff hours towards that and other financial resources, um, and to, to certainly continue to involve the Muscatine community as public art projects are brought forward. So, um, you know, at this time, I'll take any questions or comments. Um, any questions from council? Councilman Brasborn? A couple of, I'm sorry, a couple of comments. Um, as far as funding goes, um, some cities have done a really interesting job, like Iowa City, where they do Herky the Hawk competitions every year, and then that becomes public art that, mm -hmm. that private, <clears throat> private folks that entered the competition end up maintaining for the year or however long they want. Mm -hmm. um, that's a thought, just, yeah. um, the other one is, uh, and, and it helps brand a city. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like a, an example in, oh, Abilene, Texas, where they've become the storybook capital of the world because they've put out a lot of storybooks. Mm -hmm. uh, again, going back to Iowa City, they've got the pianos that folks have yeah. painted, they've got the Herkies. I think someone in, cheese country started cows um, and and all of that is ways to continually fund it um, Iowa City has a, 
a code um, requirement on all new construction that a certain mm -hmm. percentage of mm -hmm. that has to go to art. Mm -hmm. um, now, whether that goes in our case, whether we choose to make that part of the building they're doing or if it just goes into a fund, yeah. that would be another way to fund maybe art everywhere versus just in the building that's being built. Um, so just a couple of thoughts. I don't know yeah. what, your, and what, if what you, are your thoughts to that. If you um, look at the uh, attachment in your packets tonight and it included the full list of um, the recommendations and the idea of a percent for art, especially if it comes from, say, a city project, you know, had that been factored in, say, when um, Second Street was redone, then there would have been money available to, to do Zenith or other projects. Um, it makes it uh, just a challenge when there's not a set fund. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, it hard to, you know, it, I, I, I uh, don't really wish to put on the fundraising hat for public art when I need to do that to support the Muscatine Art Center. Um, so it's, it's very challenging without a set fund you know, funding mechanism. And, uh, you know, I have, I have um, you know, submitted grants for public art in the past. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes not. But, you know, we try, and we try to do what we can with the resources we have available. <clears throat> Council Member Gordon. Yep. Um, I, I agree with Jeff. And actually, uh, City Administrator Webb and I have talked about this in the past, is how do you fund public art? by collecting a fee or a portion of a capital project. So it's not coming out of our general fund and things like that. But that 1%, mm -hmm. I mean, some people do five, that's a lot of oh, heavy lift. But that 1% of Second Street, of Grandview, of Park Avenue could make a nice fund. I think we just need to work on that and see how we can do it. Um, you think about a normal contingency fund of a project, it's what, 10%-ish? is usually the you know contingent well one percent i think would go i mean great so i think we should work on it council member osborne we also have a fairly healthy emergency fund right now um you know john's poked at that quite a bit um, fairly healthy what emergency fund right now um that could maybe be seed money to get something started um just a thought for council yeah. But this get it started so that as we have, because we always have capital projects. I mean, we've done a lot with roads lately. We're going to continue to always do a lot with roads. Think about what Isaac would do if we had a percentage of the Isaac project. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, just 1% of our capital budget would go yeah, along. With I think this. so. I think we can maybe have a smaller group look at what some cities, I think, uh, Administrator Webb has said, like Coralville, I think does yeah, that there, so this there are a few cities i think in iowa that use that model yeah. there are others too though you could look yes. at yeah so we don't have to start fresh we can benchmark theirs and you know we can borrow their code so i think it's a great opportunity and i agree with you jeff if i may i i wanted to make a comment related to funding and and uh the, the comment that melanie offered about staff um the, those of us on the Public Art Advisory Commission that are not members of the Muscatine Art Center staff, uh, we recognize that that uh, Melanie Melanie's got a lot on her plate to run that museum to begin with, mm -hmm. and and she does a lot of the heavy lifting for us, and we're very appreciative. Uh, but as she, as she said, to put on the fundraising hat, that becomes. Um, a bit of a conflict, I think, in, in her role as director of the Art Center. Um, and we've, we've talked amongst ourselves that if, if we had a, even a half-time person, we had someone that, that was earmarked to manage public art, um, not only would, could that person then manage projects and activities that are coming through that we've, that we've identified, but also put on the hat to go find grant opportunities and other funding sources and fund fundraising. So I wanted to say that. Any other comments? Councilmember Osborne. And Jim, as a, as a former business owner and neighbor of ours downtown, well, you know, you put, business owner, 
right? Yeah. You don't have yeah. To do well, I should say as a downtown, you put a mural, you put a mural on your property downtown. Right. We see that happening a lot. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of curious for my own information. You know, we, we, we have a focus in this group about public city owned properties and everything. Is there any, you know, some of these walls uh, that are privately owned around the community gather graffiti, the owners have to clean it up, and one of the number one ways to stop that from happening is put a mural on it. Um, any thoughts about maybe picking some of those sites as, and partnering with the property owners on public art? Yes, I mean, we've, we've talked um, with the Public Art Advisory Commission as, as we had on one of the slides specifically, whether or not the city and, and kind of be administered from this Public Art Advisory Commission um, to have some sort of a mural policy, not just a mural policy and what, what's, um, what you should and shouldn't do, but, but best practices and for long-term maintenance and, and what do you put on there? You know, I mean, what would we as a city like to see on private property that is really public space? Yeah, yeah it'd be uh, great to see standards, right? Because, yeah. you know, I could, I could paint a building and then five years later it starts peeling off. And, right, you right. Know, and that's and not we, we've talked, we don't necessarily consider us that we need to be the mural police, but to, to oh, establish but a set of recommendations. Standards, yeah. So. yeah. I mean, those murals, a couple of murals you had there along Mulberry, um, man, they've, they've lasted a long, they look <laughs> faded, so they must've been there a long time and they're not fading, but there's <clears throat> others that are newer than that that are needing repainting already, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. Now, some of that has to do with, the, you know, that soft brick yep. is a problem, but. Yeah, I mean, and there's there's a lot of things to, you know, prepping the building and, and the paint that you use to prep it, but then also the paint for the mural itself. Yeah. So. Any other questions? So I'm looking for some direction. I know the reason that we're talking about this this evening is because council identified in your um, goal setting session, uh, it's worded evaluate opportunities for funding and pursuing public art. And so how you, how you might want to move that forward, I, the ideas that have been talked about tonight is further e evaluating the funding opportunities for funding so we could bring something additional back on that. We could also bring back more specifics on mural standards. Are those the areas or is there more council would like to see come back to to the group? I think that pretty much sums I think it up. definitely the funding and then maybe the governance of art overall because we talk a lot about murals are the ones that are in your face. But if you're going to is your commission, what is your governance plan? That well, might be well, I think what, what I would be really excited about is if we could develop a master plan for art in public places, and that would probably involve bringing in, I don't have all the time in the world, I'm already super busy, um, and I think it would benefit from having some outside source come and help us develop that and to run some community um, engagement around that topic to help us figure out what, you know, what are our strengths right now? What do we need to work on? What areas of town? Because not everything needs to be, you know, right in the downtown or the riverfront or, you know, there's, there's so many different areas in town that could involve more local neighborhoods. Um, but, to, but to have a, a firm actually come and help us do a um, public art master plan, I think would really get us off to a good start and give us some, some steps for what to do next outside of, you know, just increasing the budget. So <laughs> is that something council's interested in looking at? It's, it's a great concept. The moment I heard firm, I hear cost and all of a sudden, the cost is taking away from other uh, opportunities. But let's see what we can do. Mm -hmm. Let's see if there's some intern opportunities or some graduate studies that students that might be interested. Or let's see if there's grants. I mean, we're so close to the University of Iowa. 
Well, right. you're already paying a cost through my time. Yeah. So, you know, whatever I whatever hours I put into that or writing grants for that is going to be time away from my main purpose of no, doing your center. No, I'm not thinking so, it should be. Yeah, so it's like well, where, where does that resource come from? Yeah, you're so, a guiding factor. You're a str you're the strategy. But let's see is there any We can get a feel for cost. That okay. might be helpful. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm sure we can get do a little research on that. It might be something limited in scope, maybe that so you know that wouldn't be that costly. We, you know, we could bring some ideas back. I think. Yeah, and if yeah. it's foundational, then we can build on it. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. We can explore that and see what take your temperature on if we should pursue it or not. Yeah. And there may be some po some opportunities through University of Iowa. I, I've been in contact with them on again, off again about things involving the arts in Muscatine. So they they might be able to facilitate something. Great. Just, just can yes. I repeat back just so I make yes, sure that we know what we're doing um, so I will work with Melanie and her group to maybe bring back some sort of framework around mural standards is that mm -hmm. okay um, that we will bring back some thoughts and maybe some recommendations on how we might fund art and that we will also bring back some kind of rough ideas on cost and approach for an arts master plan mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. All right, and next, Central Business District Parking Overview. Save the best for last. <laughs> I drew the unlucky straw and I get to be last tonight on the agenda. <laughs> uh, yeah. They wouldn't have to beg for me. Um, one of the council goals for this um, upcoming year was to study the parking system in the central business di district and implement identified improvements. So this is the overview of beginning of the study to give everybody the same in basic information about the parking system. Um, <coughs> just kind of an overview of the presentation. It's, it's a lot of it's informational. Um, it, um, I'll, there's a brief overview of the city's parking ordinances, um, parking facilities and equipment, um, the goals of the parking ordinances and enforcement program, overview of the current enforcement operation, overview of the fine collection procedures, um, and an overview of the parking, the parking system is set up as an enterprise fund. So of the revenues to that enterprise fund and expenditures from the um, parking enterprise fund. Uh, the next general area is um, discussion of the categories of primary downtown parking users. And that has evolved over the years. And then considerations for updates to parking, um, both co parking configurations and equipment updates, including um, uh, the need to look at the budget implications of those. And then at the end, um, just a general discussion of how the city council would want to proceed with the study of the current operation and planning for updates. Uh, the next couple slides, and I'll just kind of briefly go over them. Um, if people want to look at the um, city ordinances, most of them are in Title Seven, Chapter One, and Title Seven, Chapter Nine. Um, I'll just pick out a few of these um, references that I have on the PowerPoint. Um, 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 seven one seven and seven one eight provides for the administrative review if people want to appeal um, parking um, by parking tickets. Uh, definitions are in 791. 
Um, the downtown parking zone is in 794. Uh, coin operation of meter, 795. Uh, 796 is on-street uh, meters and rates and on-street uh, meter restrictions. Um, and that basically allows city council to set um, parking fees by resolution. Uh, it doesn't require an ordinance change. Um, the current rates are 25 cents per hour for the long-term meters, and, and those have times that you can um, be in those up to 10 hours at a day at 25 cents per day. Um, and some of them are faded, but you can kind of tell the 10 hour meters, they have red, red tops on them. And that's for people, uh, people can use them if they wanna park all day if they work downtown. Um, and then the other ones are um, two hour maximum um, rates, uh, hours on the meter, and those are 50 cents per hour. And those are generally in um, uh, places where we um, encourage turnover um, in those spaces. Um, 798, um, that sets the meter enforcement hours from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then 799B um, actually provides, especially for the two hour meters, um, that it's unlawful to extend those times more than the two hour maximum to get the uh, turnover in the spaces. There are around, I don't know how we got that close to 1400, but we're at 1,399 spaces in the uh, central business di district. And that does include the, rev uh, the, the riverfront. Um, so there's um, 666 uh, on the riverfront, uh, and those are all free spaces. And that's 47% of the total number of um, spaces. Uh, there's 269 two-hour meters, 130 10-hour meters. So the metered parking is about 28% of the total number of spaces. Uh, 41 handicap spaces and then 293 lease spaces. So 21% of the total are, are, are lease spaces. Um, there are um, six off-street lots and each of those uh, consists of combinations of leased or reserved spaces, metered, or free spaces uh, with time limits. And I'll kind of quickly go through lot one. Um, that's a Chestnut Street lot by Pro Hair. Um, and I won't read all of these. There's 19 10 hour meters in that lot, seven lease spaces, and one handicapped. Uh, lot two, and that is by um, Second and Pine, and this has probably the most variety of spaces in it. Uh, there's 16 uh, spaces free up to four hours once per day, uh, five two-hour meters, 15 ten-hour meters, four lease spaces, and one handicap space. Lot four, and that's Sycamore and Mississippi Drive. Um, 13 free up to three hours once per day, 39 10 hour meters, 40 lease spaces, three handicapped. Uh, lot six is only for um, Clark House residents. Lot seven is across, east third across from City Hall. Uh, most of that is leased or reserved spaces. Uh, there's a few. Um, uh, 10 hour meters also in that lot. And lot eight is off of Cedar Street between second and third street. Um, and most of that lot is lease spaces, 50, 50 lease spaces, uh, five free up to three hours and two handicap spaces. Um, we do have some off street or on street lease spaces um, uh, next to the new come and go. Uh, between 4th and 5th, there's 19 uh, leased or reserved spaces. And there's uh, free on-street parking. There's a total of 167 
free on um, on street meters and that includes uh, the second street that was made free up to the two hours once per day in each block and then it also includes the free back in angle parking that was um, uh, um, constructed as part of the Mississippi Drive project. Um, this next slide, it um, kind of goes into the goals of the parking enforcement um, program. Um, it's basically to provide control of the parking spaces to ensure that the restrictions are enforced. The primary goal is to provide short-term parking for customers in the downtown business district. Um, the enforcement program is also involved in um, controlling uh, loading zones, lease parking violations, and other parking regulations. Um, another part of the, um, it's not in the ordinances, but with the um, uh, parking fund, it's um, the downtown landscaping um, uh, program. And that helps provide aesthetically to the downtown business environment. Uh, one fourth of a park department groundskeeper position is allocated to the parking uh, fund and they have the responsibility for uh, maintaining the landscaping and that includes the um, hanging baskets during the summer months that I think are um, pretty popular with um, uh, downtown uh, uh, users. <coughs> The enforcement operation, we have two part-time uh, meter attendants um, um, and each has a handheld ticket writer um, that has electronic chalking capabilities. Um, so um, the handhelds are, are used to uh, issue tickets and also do the electronic chalking. Um, the attendants enter the license number, vehicle make and color, violation number, space number in those devices. Um, and if it's for an expired meter, the, the, there's a code for a meter violation. Um, also another code for pro prohibited zone handicap violations. Um, for electronic chalking, they enter the same information and uh, for example, on 2nd Street, those uh, up to two hours once per day in each block, they enter the information for each of the vehicles and then two hours or more later, go back and uh, see if those, those um, vehicles have moved. Um, there are, um, uh, people that, that know that and they move to a different block. And then there's still, there was 924 of those tickets for over two hours on 2nd Street issued last fiscal year. Uh, and then at the end of their shifts, the um, meter attendants uh, download the tickets for the day into the software system and then set the handhelds um, so they're recharged for the next morning. Um, the, there were 8,300 expired meter tickets issued last fiscal year. Uh, the total number of tickets issued was over 10,000. And the um, parking software, we also enter tickets issued by the police department throughout town. So if they um, issue, that's um, um, part of our collection procedures. Uh, the fine collection system <coughs> overview. Um, people can pay their tickets in several ways. There's drop boxes uh, throughout the downtown that they can uh, put their tickets and the um, payments in. And then um, uh, the parking staff picks those up every, every morning so they're applied um, promptly. Uh, they can come in finance and pay them in person. 
Um, they can be mailed in and they can be, be paid online through the parking payment option um, that's noted on the ticket. Uh, the finance secretary parking coordinator in my office, and that's uh, Lori Moss, um, one half of her position is charged to the parking enterprise fund and she spends quite a bit of time on um, um, parking tasks. Um, she applies all payments of tickets, no matter if they're paid um, online or um, from the drop boxes to, to credit them in the system. Uh, she assists people if they want to appeal their tickets and gets the information ready for the appeal panel to consider. Uh, just for your information, we, she um, takes names off of that. So the panel just looks at, at, their, at the people's request to, to waive those tickets. Um, and we have no idea who, who they are and that keeps any, any bias out of the, the process. If um, uh, individuals still don't like the decision of the appeal panel, uh, then Lori assists them, they can, they can go and, and take it to court for further action. And we do have several of those that, that, that have chosen to, to, to go to court. Um, um, parking coordinator also sends out uh, notices for unpaid tickets. And there's two notices sent before the tick unpaid tickets are sent to the county treasurer's office, uh, where the uh, treasurer uh, collects them on behalf of the city at the time the people renew their, their registrations, they have to um, pay their tickets. Um, and, and people choose to do that. There's an extra $5 fee um, that we pay to the um, treasurer and the uh, individuals pay if they um, decide to um, not pay their tickets by the other methods. And um, there was a total of 27, over 27,000 of tickets that people chose not to pay directly and they were collected by the county treasurer on, on our behalf and that was 35% of the total fines collected. Um, the parking coordinator also manages the lease parking spaces um, and does the billing. And some of those are, um, uh, we encourage people to do it annually. Uh, they can pay quarterly. Um, and then there's some reconciliations between what's the payments that are applied in the software to what we have collected in the ledger. Uh, revenues of the Parking Enterprise Fund in general, um, about 76,000 um, annually from parking meter fees. Um, when you think of change, you don't think it adds up to that much, but it is 76,000 um, from the meters. 48,000 from uh, lease parking fees, 55,000 from parking fines, and then smaller amounts for meter hoods um, and interest in miscellaneous. Uh, meter hoods are um, only for construction related purposes and, um, and some of that money is, um, it, it basically pays what what the meters would have collected if they were there. So around the um, new Sa Stanley Center, those meters are being put back, but those were taken out for construction purposes, I think for probably close to two years. Uh, so the total estimated revenues, and this is the budget for FY24, uh, 180,300. And the expenditures, a, a lot of the expenditures, it totals 192,000 in expenditures. Um, a, a lot of those funds are for staff time. 
So the wages and benefits of the two part-time meter attendants, 73,600. 50% um, of the parking uh, coordinator <clears throat> wages and benefits, 47,500. 25% uh, of the uh, parks groundkeeper position, 23,000. 10% uh, of the wages and benefits of the public works equipment operator, uh, about 9,100. And the public works um, staff um, help us with, um, uh, the, the meter attendants couldn't do the small changing batteries, but a lot of times it's public works. People need to do um, a bigger maintenance related um, uh, task for us. And then 5% uh, of the finance director for oversight. So 162,000 for wages and benefits. And then I've just got the categories of other expenses. There's the regular city administrative fees and those are uh, assigned to each um, uh, enterprise fund. Operating supplies includes batteries, uniforms for the meter attendants, office supplies, et cetera. Um, annual software maintenance fees, meter repairs, postage um, for mailing um, out fine, uh, unpaid fine notices. Uh, there's debit or credit card fees if people pay online. Um, uh, there's a fee involved in that. Each year we have allowed about um, 2,200 for replacement meters and this could be ones that can't be repaired. We've had a occasion when meters get stolen as well. Um, and then various other miscellaneous expenses, 3,100. So we do have budgeted 192,000, which is, which is more than what our estimated revenues are. Um, so we usually budget that way and um, depending on how things can come out, we hoped we don't impact the fund balance that much. Um, some of it we haven't looked at um, with the pandemic. We didn't wanna look at increasing fees at that time. Um, but um, if we're gonna look at the whole system, that's a time to look, look at revenues as well. Um, Categories of downtown parking users. And there really is a, a pretty good mix of things in Muscatine's downtown. And often people say, well, why can't we be like another city? But every, every downtown is different. We have a combination of businesses, government offices, professional offices, um, employers, downtown residents. Um, and, and each has varying parking needs. Um, the basic allocation of the types of parking uh, was implemented in 2007. There have been minor changes since then, um, and, and some of those were, were with the goal of balancing the needs of the various users. Um, an example of balancing uses um, and occasionally we have issues with it but the the leases the lease spaces are only for monday through friday um, i think 6 a.m to 6 p.m i don't have the exact hours uh, but then that same lot number seven is used for the farmer's market on saturdays so there are some balancing that that need to be done as far as um, people, different uses for the, um, uh, for the various um, facilities. Um, then we have the short-term parking needs and that's um, for the two hour meters throughout the downtown. But short-term parking is also provided with the free parking on second street for a maximum of the two hours once per day. And then the, um, and then that uh, tries to address the needs of the customers um, and, and people that have the businesses and office to, to encourage that turnover in the spaces. 
the longer term parking needs, uh, the 10 hour meters, um, and lease spaces also um, satisfy the people wanting to have um, longer term parking. Uh, the free back in angle parking on Mississippi Drive and the free parking on the riverfront address the needs of, of uh, many that want to park um, all day and um, uh, and having it free is an added benefit. Um, in larger cities, if there was free parking within two blocks, people would think it was a miracle. Yeah. And we kind of take that kind of thing for granted. Uh, downtown residents, um, and that number has been increasing and that needs to be blended in with the other needs. Um, and, we're, and it's expected, uh, probably will be increasing in, in future years. There's been a number of inquiries about adding additional. Um, some of the downtown residents have access to their own parking spaces as part of their, as part of their rent. Um, uh, others need to look at the city's off street lots or other options. Um, when the um, Hershey lofts opened, um, they took a number and, and the, I think the owner actually, as part of meeting the parking requirements, leases a certain number of places, the places, spaces, and then they assign it to their tenants. Uh, so that, that help fill up that that lot across from City Hall. Um, the um, parking needs of the downtown residents, um, I think for the most part, they're for um, evening and night hours. Um, the city does offer a reduced lease rate for downtown residents. Um, and that is, um, I made a note of that and I left it on my desk. Um, the regular, if people pay their lease parking um, annually, it's $300 a year. If they choose to pay it quarterly, it totals out to $350 a year, but $87.50, I think, a, a quarter. Um, and, um, but downtown residents have a, their, and they can pay every six months, but their rate is $175. So we do, we have accommodated, tried to accommodate people that uh, live downtown with a reduced rate for the rate uh, for their spaces. Um, and while there's been some turnover in lease spaces, over 95% have been leased since the pandemic. It dropped when um, people were working from home and the businesses weren't open, but um, it's now rebounded and there's, I think some of the lots are full, but there's generally a few people that may change jobs or, th or things. So generally we can try to accommodate people, um, uh, but it is a, a combination of people that live downtown work downtown, uh, shop downtown. So it's, it's a combination of needs we're trying to satisfy with the um, parking structure. So then we tried to lay out um, um, considerations for updating to both parking <coughs> configurations and equipment and including budget considerations. Um, it's, as I said, it's been a number of years when the um, parking lots were set up as far as the allocation between lease spaces and meters and the free up to a certain amount of um, time. Um, I haven't heard any specific request as far as that, but it probably is something we should look at if we're looking at the parking operation. Um, it, and we don't necessarily want to add um, more lease spaces if it would detract from the other spaces that would be available to other 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 users. 
Um, but again, to look at that probably is, is a good um, uh, thing to do before we make too many changes. Um, and then some of this is from the last time there was a, a group that looked at that. Um, um, any changes need to keep in mind that businesses evolve and change over time. So making specific changes just for a business might not be the appropriate thing to do. Um, need for technology updates uh, for meters that would accept multiple forms of payment has, has been noted by um, uh, parking users. Um, and that again, we would probably want to study what, what we have and the configurations to see how, um, how many meters we want to keep on an ongoing basis. Um, we do have funds from the uh, funds that are remaining in the second street streetscaping project. Um, and that was geo debt that's being paid for, repaid with TIF funds. And they're just now getting, I think they accepted the completed work. It looks like there's an estimated balance um, that might be up to $350,000 that could cover the, the initial cost of technology improvements. And I would hope it wouldn't be that much. Um, if, it, if there was other projects to be done in the downtown, that money could be used there too. And one of the, just as an example, um, some of the second street streetscaping could be extent, extended to some of the side streets. You know, so it's, um, but we did, when we did, when we did the bonds, um, we specifically allowed for those funds to be used for meter enhancements if we would choose to do that. Um, um, but um, item number five though, and while the capital costs would be covered from the bond proceeds, um, any ongoing fees would need to be covered by the rates. And so if there's um, ongoing um, payment card fees, ongoing if there's software, that would need to be covered by the rates. And so the rates would be um, uh, the, probably the meter rates that, that could be looked at. Um, the, the goal of this is that, um, that it should, the parking system should be self-supporting. We shouldn't have to um, fund it from the general fund if, if the parking enforcement is something that we wanna continue. And then this last page is, there's a number of questions. I'll, I, I'll read them all in total and not discuss each one. Um, but before things proceed, um, uh, we'll need to have a general concurrence of city council to reaffirm the need for parking enforcement. And with the number of tickets and violations, um, I think voluntary compliance. Uh, I, I don't see voluntary compliance um, working. Um, is there concurrence of city council to review the current configurations of parking spaces, especially in the lots between um, metered spaces, lease spaces, that type of thing? Um, concurrence of council to balance the needs of businesses, customers, employees, downtown residents, and any changes that would be implemented. Uh, concurrence of city council for staff to look at options for upgrading uh, the meter technology uh, to allow for multiple forms of payment. Um, number five is again what we had the last slide. Is there concurrence of council that any ongoing fees for technology improvements or other changes be fund fr funded from increased parking fees. And then the last item is um, just a discussion on how, how to proceed with the, um, 
with this, um, I've thrown out a few things, staff review of the parking configurations, staff review of parking meter technology upgrades, uh, or a committee be formed to assist in ev evaluating uh, parking configurations and technology updates. Um, so I, I think at this time, gen general feedback, we're not making any decisions tonight, but we wanted to have all, everybody have the same information to start from. Council Member Gindrich. Just, uh, you know, Nancy, how many complaints do you get about the configuration? I know people complain about parking and so forth, but specifically this configuration issue. I haven't received any. So, uh, you know, I, I'm in favor of reviewing all these things, but I, you know, I don't hear any complaints either about configuration. It's, uh, you know, what's the, the riverfront and what's worked for businesses and things like that. Uh, I don't think our staff should waste time on discussing configuration. And uh, I'm basically in favor of reviewing all the rest of this. So that's my two cents. Mayor, I hope not to say another word. <laughs> You're good. You're fine. <laughs> Councilmember Osborne. Uh, I would be against changing anything with one, two, and three. Um, you know, the configuration to keep the enforcement going. I like the way that, it, you know, it self-supports itself. Um, I, you know, this balance of the needs, customers, employees, I, I agree with your statement around, we gotta be careful around, you know, we got a certain business somewhere and next year it could be something else. So, you know, it's really hard to plan around that. I think the strategy of I envision down on parking strategy to be like a bullseye. You know, Second Street is the center of the bullseye. That's where we want the turns, and you go out another layer, and we end up with some more, you know, longer term options. And you go out another layer, it's more something to keep in mind as you consider these. The least parking is only for the nights. All day long, those are free and open spaces. They're not enforced. I don't know if everybody understands that, but when you lease a spot downtown, you don't own it all day. It's only from like 6 p.m. at night till. No, it's yeah. opposite that. Just the opposite? Yeah, you know, so it is, day. a lot of it is for downtown Okay, workers. I knew it was like half the day. It's yeah. been a while. Yeah. The other thing, too, is the whole thing about um, the the meter or the folks that go around with the, the cards and everything. The reality is you can park on 2nd Street from 3 in the afternoon till about 10 o'clock the next morning because of the way they show up at 8 o'clock in the morning. They can't really ticket anybody for two hours. So really 10 o'clock is when the first tickets get issued. And then after three o'clock, you know, if, if you're there at two and you go past five, you know, 4.30 or whatever, you're gonna get a two hour ticket. But if you park there at three, you know, you're good till about 10 o'clock the next morning. So that's just, just, just some food for thought. Um, I would give a high priority to, a very high priority of this whole list if we did one thing at all, um, to look at options for upgrading the, the technology and then if uh, I, I think increasing the fees is kind of a no-brainer um, I would use uh, a model similar to Iowa City's where it's a graduated thing for an example is what I would I would consider but you know that'd be up to staff to decide how you want to do it we obviously gotta you know if you're saying we need when we put meters in we're gonna need more money I I don't really think we've got a problem with that especially if you look at neighboring cities and their costs for meters and everything else shouldn't be a problem Any other thoughts? The only comment I have is uh, I get a lot of complaints about meters that aren't functioning. People put money into the meter and it doesn't work or it doesn't register and then they get a ticket because they didn't move their car to another meter. I, I don't know what we ever do about that. It's just, I, we, we, we need to look at a technology solution. Yeah. We, we do encourage people to call in and we will have people go out and check the meters and if they're found to found to be um, not functioning correctly. And sometimes coins do get jammed, that type of thing. And then we'll, we'll take care of the tickets in that case. Um, and it hasn't happened for quite a few years now, but 
we did have issues with people always saying that their meters malfunctioned. Um, That's the whole point, you don't know. I just have a comment. So, you know, if, if there is going to be a big cost for potentially the idea of going to a new technology, do you think it'd be beneficial to at least try a trial basis, continue the, the actual meters that are there currently with an app system ta attached to it? So like a sticker app, QR code. So someone could either put coins in or they can just do the, the QR code basis. Um, if they're in boonies, if they're in boonies, hey, you have 15 minutes left. Oh, I better add 30 minutes to it. So I know that there's those apps right there also that can be utilized. You're just looking at the cost of stickers and maybe, and I don't know if this is like against code or anything like that, so please forgive me, but you know, maybe there's some of the, um, the meters. I mean, they definitely need some, like some paint, so maybe there's a way to work with the, you know, the public art um, group and see if there's, I don't even know if that's a thing. Maybe I'm speaking. Yeah, it is actually a thing. A lot of cities yeah. do turn their um, meters into art. Hey. That's, that's a pretty common occurrence. I think if we were to get new meters that accepted multiple form of payment, we probably wouldn't be able to sure. do that. Um, Just the old meters, yeah. Yeah, I'd have to in, we'd have to investigate. I'm not sure how we would sort of track the parking um, w with a sticker. Like there might be some challenges so, in that, yeah. So basically, yeah, yeah. there's the one that the ones I've been looking at. It's an app. So they're they're walking around right now with uh, the electronic thing, and they're it shows how long they're parking there. But an app would also pop up as well so it'd be a, probably a separate device which now you're carrying a couple diff different devices or is it expense what's that what's the expense the expense would be probably just the monthly cost of the service and downloading the app just to administer it we so could research take it out of the fee yeah. so we could we, research some options there i think yeah we need to see the technology vendor options they need to come and sell us uh -huh. so we can see it i think the committee Mm -hmm. Narrowing that down might be a great idea, but we need to keep moving forward quickly. Quite a few of the meters accept, they'll accept coins, card, mm -hmm. or app. They'll do take any of those things, not a check, but <laughs> everything else. <laughs> I gave up once I took And I was just, <laughs> just being mindful of the, the cost component of it, like doing a trial basis. And then if that goes really well, and if we're getting good feedback, then it would make sense to spend the... 300 or whatever thousand dollars it was to update and, and I hope it's not that much money sure well me too <laughs> right um, the, just, a, just a, again idea but. the um, just one thing I want to point out though if um, there's a learning curve for if there was an app and not everybody would be able to pick that up and we do get complaints or we used to, I haven't heard these for a while, is how come I got a ticket and they didn't get a ticket? You know, that type of thing. So I, I think it may be time to look at all the options sure. and, and then choose which way to go. Um, Does council want to look at at least getting some information, having mm -hmm. the uh, vendors come and talk to the team, mm -hmm. basically? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think we should, you know, staff should move ahead with uh, in a process that's most efficient for them. I didn't like uh, repeat again that configuration isn't a problem, doesn't sound like, but I think everything else is an issue. And the only configuration thing that I've noticed is that um, lot two, second in pine, has a lot of different options in there. and. And I don't think it would be that much staff time for them to monitor for a few weeks just what's being used and what isn't being used, um, that type of thing. I, I don't know in the other lots if there's that much concern, but the lot lot two is, is really a kind of a, sorry not to say hodgepodge, but, but it is a, a, a number of different things that might be able to be improved. I can see that with lot two. I can see that with lot two. Mm -hmm. I like lot two. <laughs> it is nice. 
But we got to remember, like Pine Street is really part of the system too. We don't really count it, but Pine is all free parking, just like Mississippi Drive is. Um, you know, at least at least the downtown side of it might be, and then maybe the other side is residential. I don't know how to split Pine Street, but it is between that parking lot and Pine Street. That's a lot of parking. A lot of parking. And, and we do have a, a really quite a few spaces and um, a good mix of businesses. And, and so if people aren't necessarily gonna be able to park right in front of where they wanna go, but, but hopefully they can find a place within reasonable walking distance. So a council consensus, the majority to move forward, at least to get a vendor to come in and talk with the leadership yeah, probably if it, so just so I understand we only want to work on the t technology. I'm I'm not hearing any other need to evaluate the system itself. I think there's some opportunities. I would prefer the committee to come back taking Nancy's information. Technology is the biggest piece. But there are I mean, I think the processes are well defined. Uh, there might be some opportunities there, but I think a committee might help that. So. Well, and I also think we need to reaffirm the parking enforcement downtown mm -hmm. too, because we would do that. Then we're going to we're going to have every businessman parking downtown, yeah. and that sucks. Okay, mm -hmm. so I just I think I would need to know. Um, so I'm hearing yes, we want to continue to enforce parking. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. yes. Um, the current configuration is not an issue. We want to keep balancing the needs, so yes on that. We we do want to look at we do want to look at options for parking meter technology, um, and what would the cost would be associated with any of that wireless support or whatever. Um, I I don't think for the technology. I mean, we can certainly pull together a committee for that. That's probably something we could do by by putting out bids. I mean, we can get information that way. Request for proposal. And and yeah, and we could have people from the parking system users be a part of the mm -hmm. committee to select it. Or go to our benchmark cities and see what they've implemented recently. I did reach out to several cities. I got a few comments back on that, so I can sure. use that. But I think. The route I would suggest, if we're not trying to fix anything else, that we would just um, issue a, a request okay. for for bids for that, and have people who use the system help us select one. Yep, sounds good. I like that. Okay. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much for the feedback. Thank you, Nancy. Sure. <laughs> Council Member Lewis, I don't know how we're going to do this with you sharing information, but why don't you, uh, I guess we'll just go with Hoppy. No comment tonight. Okay. Council Member Gordon? Nothing tonight, thank you. Nothing tonight, Your Council Member Fralick, Council Member Brackert? Nothing tonight. Council Member Gindrich? I do, I'm sorry you guys, I'll be quick. Uh, I had a nice comment about Weed Park Pool, how beautiful it is, and uh, what a great time they had at a, at a kid's birthday party. Uh, uh, Weed Park Aquatic Center, uh, looking great. Real quick, Deep Lakes Beach, what a, a great place to take your kid. Uh, and uh, make sure you watch the Ask a Five-Year-Old program from Musser uh, Public Library. Uh, promoting the uh, uh, fifth anniversary of the HNI and Musser uh, you know, public library uh, merger. Uh, it's uh, uh, very informative. And uh, just this morning reported to me, uh, Mr. Taylor at Musser Library, uh, what a great storyteller he is. Very engaging and does a great job with the kids. There's a nine o'clock program every Thursday throughout the month of June. It's called Adventure, uh, uh, Adventure uh, Story, Adventure Story Hike. He tells stories, and they're out in the uh, woods and so forth. Uh, today they were at uh, uh, Discovery Center, uh, the 15th Salisbury, the 22nd Fuller Park, and the 29th Wildcat Den. But hats off to Mr. Taylor and uh, that program that it's free ages four to nine-year-olds, uh, really uh, was just a, a great uh, event that uh, they put on today. So 
pass that word on, about, especially about these uh, adventure story hikes, and get on the uh, web page for uh, the library to get more information on that. Or call me, or text me, or email me, or email the mayor. And then I'll pass it to you. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Councilmember Osborne. Oh, and things to do. I'm going to feature Muscatine's parks um, and our cemetery, actually, Greenwood Cemetery. You know, we've got, we've got uh, some great feedback that Carol shared with council, uh, voicemail. Uh, kudos to staff for that, that feedback. They, they own it, and they've done a great job. Even, I mean, our cemetery is worth visiting, let alone the parks and everything else. Uh, nice job. Krista, would you have anything you'd like to share? <laughs> Administrator Webb. For me. And I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved.